Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play, where uh, you might notice a slight change in the uh, the scenery here because I've been moving my studio around. So I apologize, I haven't been around for a little while, but that's not important. What's really important is it's time for Ankh, which is why you're here. You want to know all about these ancient relics we've uncovered from Egypt. Hey Heggers, hey Bryce. Yes, we're, we've dusted away the sands of history and we've uncovered something new. It's the third game in the Eric Lang series. It has arrived. And actually, there was something quite surprising on it. I'll grab it right now, but check this out. And yes, you might notice I'm sunburned. And the reason we're doing this, part of the reason, so I don't usually do unboxings. I very occasionally, when it's something special like ether fields or like this. But uh, also, it's very, very hot in London right now. It's almost too hot to, oh God. It's almost too hot to play games. Hopefully tomorrow it'll be a bit cooler. It's even, it's, it's 9.30 in the evening here. It's still very hot. But check this out. Can this really possibly be the 465,000th pledge for Ankh? Was there roughly half a million pledges for this game? That's bananas. I didn't check the Kickstarter page, but that's nuts. That's absolutely nuts how many Kickstarters there are. For this or how many backers there are for this game yeah Nero it does come with a crane to like to like get it up the stairs um, they actually they send around um, Anubites to lift it up for you lest you die and visit uh, Anubis in the Egyptian underworld that's probably about where my Egyptian mythology knowledge is gonna end I'm not very good I, I recognize the Egyptian gods but I'm not very good at knowing what they do or what they are I just know I like Bastet because she's a cat. Alright, I need a, I need a, my archaeology tools here. I should have got one of these out, actually. Before I turn the stream on, here we go. This is a tool used by many archaeologists, of course. It's the, uh, the, um, delicate thing. The, the thing that opens up the ancient relics. Hey, Difter, hey, Chris, thanks for joining in. Um, on this this live stream, which I'm now not in anymore, is this a better angle? Oh, hello, green screen. Go away. There we go. No, the camera still can't see me because I'm not on the camera. Hello. <laughs> so I don't actually. So this is like I'm pretty sure this is the all-in pledge for this. Um. Hey, Difter. Yeah. Well, you know. Um. I've actually reorganized the entire studio. This is the first thing I've shot, so I'm quite pleased to see that the stream is up and running and everything seems to be running okay. The one thing that I have done is now all the controls are on my left, which means that um, I'm going to have to develop my ambidexterity. Because I used to control the stream with my right hand, and now I control it with my left hand. Oh, this is exciting. I'm excited to see what's in here, actually. Does anyone else have this coming in chat? Anyone else got a copy? Delicately, delicately, don't damage the uh, the ancient artifacts inside. Hey, Christy, thanks for joining in. And uh, Christopher from Costa Rica, thanks for checking out the stream. So, I'm, yeah, I'm personally very excited to get this to the table. Partly, I think, because we've been um, in lockdown for so long, you know, and just the idea of playing one of these sort of, like, sort of um, player territory control versus player interaction games just got me very excited. Here we go. I wish I had a smoke effect or something. So, I'll add it in post. It's fine. Whoosh! Oh, there's a tantalizing additional layer of cardboard. <laughs> Chris is like, I don't play Blood Rage or Rising Sun, so I did the adult thing and didn't get this one. Shh, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no time for these sensible things. Um, it's on the Canadian boat, the one that got COVID delayed. Oh no, Chris, I'm sorry to hear that. Boxes. 
Palace board. Extra sphinxes. Uh, Pantheon extras. So this is the core set. This is called Box of Wonders. I can only assume this is all the stretch goals and whatnots. Um, the Pantheon, I know, is just more gods, more teams to play as. Um, I guess the Guardian is more enemies? Ooh. Shall we begin with the core set? That makes the most sense, doesn't it? Pekka says, is this everything? Chris says, my rising sun is still in shrink. Oh no. Um, is this everything? Uh, Pekka, I think this is everything except apparently the playmat, which surprises me because I would have thought I would have ordered the playmat. I guess I didn't on this occasion. Possibly it was very expensive. But uh, I do believe it's all the, uh, the gameplay stuff, certainly. So this is, uh, this is interesting because it says here they've got a palace dashboard in here, but they seem to have included another one. <laughs> Did they misprint it or something? I don't know. Does it just not fit in the box? <laughs> we'll find out during this unboxing. So the guardians are, of course, the, uh, the, the, the signature monsters that you usually get in these games. Um, you've always got the, uh... Christy says, the playmat comes separately, I heard. Oh, well, then I probably have that arriving at some point, possibly. I don't know, I'll have to go and check my, um... My situ... my, my pledge on wherever this was located. Um, the Guardians are, of course, the monsters. Uh, in every one of these three, there's always monsters based on the... Monsters based on the, um on the mythology and here we've got now the Egyptian creatures in addition to the the ones we've seen in the the Norse creatures we've seen in Blood Rage and the Asian East Asian creatures we've seen in Rising Sun. Um, here's Ankh, Gods of Egypt. Although my favorite uh, god, do you guys remember the story for Rising Sun? Where they uh, they just ripped a lot of them out of Wikipedia because they needed extra stretch goals. So they based one of their monsters from Rising Sun on um, on uh, the, the the phony Wikipedia page that was just nothing. That's still one of my favorite stories ever. Like literally, you have a miniature that's based on a mythological creature that was a false Wikipedia article made up by some New Zealand guys about their friend. It's great. <laughs> so the pantheon i believe is just new t new gods so i think you get another four gods in here including bastet the cat god that's the one i know about um also because she's in cleopatra and the society of architects but uh i think this is cool i like the i typically i like the asymmetry of these things so i like the asym so i like to have more teams and stuff that's always fun And that's, of course, the Egyptian um, bird god, um, Eagle Man. This is very heavy. Divine Offering. What is this? Oh, is this like plastic dashboards for all of the, uh, the gods? Is this just like fancy swag? This is very heavy. I don't know what this is necessarily this looks this must be stretch goals i think tomb of wonders <laughs> anubis has gone home you see it's the same as the corset box but anubis went home 
Okay, so yeah, there's Sobek. He was one of the gods they unlocked during the the Kickstarter campaign. And this is a uh, Ta. And all kinds of uh, upgraded bits and bobs in here. I guess these are all guardians. Which is cool. Like, there's some cool looking guardians. I like this bird here, Bennu. Let's have a look and we can go and find all these miniatures and jukeners. Oh, what fun. But I've I've still I'm still dealing with of course my um my blood rage uh blood rage? Wow, bloodborne pledge. Because it's come in so many boxes. It's an absolute nightmare and now the nightmare of boxes begins all over again. Someone make an insert, please. <laughs> But uh, let us start at the bottom and work our way up, I guess. Uh, Hager says, I think most of my Egyptian knowledge, uh, knowledge of Egyptian gods comes from Stargate SG-1. I didn't watch Stargate SG-1, but I remember Stargate fondly, the movie. Oh man, can you imagine if there was a Stargate mod for this? That would be so much fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know so. I read the rule book for this a while ago, so we'll see if I've retained any of it. And then I can actually um, give you a little bit of insight into what is actually going on in this game as well. <laughs> I'm gonna have to, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to. <laughs> get more Kallax. It's it's pretty much the entire wall behind me. It goes up really high as well. Like uh, <laughs> what you don't see here is how high the wall goes above my head. <laughs> like hang on. <laughs> um okay you're gonna lose sound for a minute here. I'll be right back. So, you see, <laughs> it's a whole wall. <laughs> like, literally, it goes up to the ceiling. If there's uh, an earthquake and I'm crushed to death, I guess this is one way I wouldn't mind going. H Heggers, there is literally no need. I, I, I think that, uh, I actually think, you know, it's it's much better to have a small and well-curated collection than an enormous collection. Um, <laughs> I like, the thing is, I like to have a reasonably diverse collection, but because I like to sort of be able to pick something that everyone can play and enjoy, you know, something for everyone. Like, I play with a lot of diverse groups, so I do enjoy having lots of different options. But also, I could probably half my collection and still have plenty of options. Um, and mostly, the most of the reason I don't is I keep them around for filming, and I have these this idea that I'm going to review them as well on the show one day. <laughs> All right, here we go. <gasps> Free, come on, content. Yeah. Well, I guess I just uh, gave you all my code, but that's fine. What is this even? I don't know what that is. We'll have to find out in due course. Here's the rule book. So there are there's a scenarios book as well, but I think this is just set up for different player counts. Oh no, it's genuinely different scenarios here. David says, with so many games in your collection, can you really remember the rules for most? Um, do you know, I think you you get it's sort of uh, that's the thing that kind of comes with practice, David. Like. Or, I mean, when I first got into board gaming, I had a really hard time just learning rules. But now I find that, um, I don't know, my brain sort of, it, it, it almost has like little shortcuts in my brain for the different, different rules and things like that. You know, everything feels a lot more familiar and, um, you know, I do usually refresh um, my, I mean, I'm a big fan of picking a game before game night. 
so we can just kind of get on with it. Like, don't get me wrong. I love it when someone comes over and they sit down and they're like, let's play a game. And I get to say, pick something. That's great. But um, I do I do prefer saying, let's, let's pick something ahead of game night. And then I can have a bit of a, a refresher because I usually am the teacher. Although I also love it when someone else teaches. So we got a lot of different scenarios here with all the different uh, player counts. Some of them start with, so if you don't know how this game works at all, um, there are three territories on the board. And actually we can go ahead and see if we can find the board maybe uh, before I, but uh, these, these scenarios are gonna be different setups for the board and things like that. And the, the, um, the different, uh, <laughs> and the different uh, different configurations you can have because the the board starts with three territories that you're competing over but over the course of the game players will create divisions within those territories so subsequently segregating the board into different sections which is uh which is super interesting i think i don't know of any i, ca I can't personally think of any territory control games where you divide the existing territories at the start of the game into sub-territories later on. I mean, I suppose it can happen quite naturally if players are building up defenses and things like that, but I don't know where... I can't think of one where you literally add actual new territory borders onto the board. And one of the things I do like about this game is that it, um, it marks the territory edges with camels. Because, as you know from our camel games, our online camel game series, Chris and I are big fans of camels. Um, this, I hate this. I don't know why Simon do this. Whenever there's like some super important board, they make it out of the thinnest paper. <laughs> they did this with the the player boards in Bloodborne. They did it with the boards in uh, Blood Rage. Fortunately, a lot of times they'll offer like thicker versions of these uh, as extra goals. So I'm hoping when we go into the the Tomb of Wonders or something, we'll find thicker versions of these, but I, I don't know. These are going to be used in literally every game all the time, and it drives me nuts that they make them out of such thin paper. Um, I don't know why it's necessarily a problem. It's just kind of, I don't know, it just kind of feels bad when you've got all this cool thick card stock otherwise. Um, so here we've got all the punch board, and... We can have a quick zoom in here. I was actually make, getting the board out. Let's, uh, but uh, there it is. So here's the board. Woo! All right, so you can see that the board starts off divided into three distinct territories, which are separated by the rivers. So you've got one here, and these actually have names. I think this is like Western Egypt, and this is like north of the Nile or something like that. I can't quite remember from from the rulebook, but and then the the spaces themselves are marked um, and divided into three different types. You've got desert, you've got fertile land, and you've got ocean or water. And of course, the river here is what is separating these these uh, territories. And so later on, what we'll do is we'll build camel caravans that follow the edges of the hexagons and divide these up into sub or into new regions uh, which is really interesting um, and also it's camels so I'm already a fan this is nice and good this is good this is good card stock as well so I don't know why these are so thin I don't know why they seem to always do that so you can take a look here and you can see there's actually all these different starting setups um, on the on the board here for the the different player counts and uh, I presume these these scenarios as far as I'm aware and you know I say it like with trepidation because the thing about um, Eric Lang games is as you'll know reading the rule book only really gives you half the game the rule book ten particularly in this triptych the rule book tends to outline the core rules by which the game will be functioning and then all of the additional material, which is to say the guardians, the guardian abilities, the gods, their 
bespoke abilities. Uh, there's battle cards in this as well, although I think all the gods have the same set of battle cards, but we'll see when we get there. But uh, the point is that they all kind of break the fundamental rules Eric Lang sets out in some way. So, you know, if we have a look down here, that's the wrong camera. Here we go. We can see the um, we can see the the scenario book here offering all these different map setups, and one of the things that's um, interesting to me about this is that are you gonna focus? No, you don't fancy focusing on that for me. One day, there we go. Um, is that uh, you've got these um, these three different building types? You've got obelisks, temples, and pyramids. And getting adjacent to these are going to help you out during the game. You want to get your warriors adjacent to them, and then you can also claim them. As far as I'm aware, there's no way to move them over the course of the game. They're fixed from the beginning of the scenario. So that's kind of interesting. So you can see there's a lot of different scenarios. So hopefully what that means is a lot of uh, replayability. And actually what's interesting as well, as you see here on the player, on the five-player board, it actually starts with a couple of car camel caravan lines. So you can already see this one starts with five region. Yeah, five regions instead of three. So that's interesting. David says, it's fascinating that Egypt was considered to be the fertile grain basket of the Roman Empire. Now it's an arid desert. A not so subtle lesson about over arming and abusing the land. Oh, and then we're getting into a history conversation. The fertile area is still there, the Nile Delta and the floodplains. Yeah, I know about history and stuff. Uh, these Ankh tokens are are uh, used to track all manner of things. They're in the, the five-player colors here. We've got uh, follower tokens. You can generate followers as an action in the game. And then you spend them to unlock powers. And here we've got the temple tokens. And uh, when you claim a temple in the game, you get to put one of your little Ankh tokens down there to show that it's yours. Hence, Ankh, the name of the game. Uh, these tiles, I believe, are associated with specific powers um, because I don't really know what they're for. I think this is Osiris's special power. He does something by putting, like, because Osiris is the god of the underworld and he was famously betrayed. I took this from an Eric Lang video on the Kickstarter page that I remember he showed this. Um, so I'm just kind of paraphrasing. I don't really know how the ability works. Hopefully we'll see it on the board in due course, but because he was betrayed, whenever he loses a battle, he gets to put out one of these tokens and then gets special uh, bonuses around that space, I think. I don't know what these ones are. You got upgrades to all that cardboard. Uh, to that, Christy, I have absolutely no doubt possibly here in the uh, the Tomb of Wonders. <laughs> Bryce says, This looks nothing like Death May Die. You've cheated me again, Lang. <laughs> this is not what I was expecting. So here are the... Again, oh, these are flimsy. Alright, so here we've got the battle cards. Um, so these ones are belong to Isis. And half of Isis is missing. But there we go. Um, so <laughs> these I enjoy these This these are the guardian cards they show the guardian's stats this is the cat mummy um, I, I like I have seen the model for this I quite like it It's we'll get it out of the box in a minute if your cat mummy is killed all other players lose one devotion so devotion is one of the ways you can win the game this is uh, the devotion board here and um, there is there's actually do we have the yeah we have the event board here so these this is actually a really interesting mechanism in the game here this is um this is the action board essentially this is a a um this is a universal board and the way it works is that uh you get to do one of these on your turn you get two actions and you pick one of these four actions to do. And there's move figures, summon figures, gain followers, and unlock Ankh powers. And so you'll get... Uh, we have a little tokens in here somewhere. That I think... Um, yeah, they're these guys here. And we'll put the... Not this one. But these four on either side. And we'll put these into little stands, I think, somewhere. 
But uh, they'll stand up, and there's the track is only as long as the player counts. So you can see for a two-player game, you start here, three players here, and four players here, and five players here. And then the um, if you take an action, you move it to the right, the token. And every time a player takes one of these actions, the, the little uh, guy moves to the right. And there's two things to sort of consider here. One is that your second action must be below your first action. So you can't take the same action twice, which is kind of interesting. So if you want to move figures, you've got to do that first. Um, so that's what this arrow is indicating here, that uh, your second action must be below the first action. But the other thing is that um, if you move the the device into this space here, um, then you trigger an event, which is this track down here, which is essentially tracking the length of the game. And uh, there's a little token that will move along here, kicking off these events, and whoever triggered the event will get to do something. And uh, then the, the thing resets to its starting position, depending on player count. And then when it gets to the end again, it moves on again, and so on, bringing it around the end of the game. Um, and also, if you trigger an event with your first action, then you don't get your second action, which is also interesting. Um, and you've got three events, primarily. You've got this one here that lets you capture the buildings on the board. So you can take the temples, the obelisks, and the, um, and the pyramids and make them your own. So you can put your Ankh on it, and now it belongs to you. It's not neutral anymore. Other players can't use it. Uh, you've got battles here, which is the whole thing. Then here, you've got the car uh, Caramel Caravan event. So the player that triggers this. These two are, like, uh, individual. So whoever triggered it gets to have it. And then the person who triggered the Camel Caravan, they get to play a new border onto the board. Um, Pekka says, is the art by Adrian Smith? I don't... I like it, but I don't know if it's just me, but I'm getting kind of tired of the same art style. It's the same in every game. Uh, this is art. This uh, this is Adrian Smith on this one. I think it's pretty cool, actually. Like, um... I think he's done a pretty good job of, like, these... creating these sort of... characters. But uh, yeah, and then you trigger off the battles, and the battles will uh, trigger war. Kind of like, uh, kind of like in Rising Sun, when you do the battle phase. You know, this is the, the same kind of thing where each region will have a war, and uh, you'll have strength that you add up, and you also play these battle cards, which have. Um, I think each player has the same set of battle cards. I'm not hundred percent sure, but. Uh, I think the battle cards are also like one use only per game. So this is the strength up here. But then they'll also have special abilities down the bottom. And I'm trying to focus the camera with my hand. Come on. But uh, yeah, so when you play the battle card, you get the bonus at the bottom and also the strength at the top. But then you can only play them once per game, I think. So you'll have to change up the, 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 the card next time. But uh, that keeps it sort of surprising. Um, yeah, so what do you guys want to see from the core set first? Do you want to see the... Uh, what a strange box. I always find the, this, these brown boxes that C1 do kind of annoying. Um, I never really know what to do with it. Do I just throw it away? Pekka says, to me, the characters look like the ones from Hate. Well, that doesn't surprise me, because um, he Adrian Smith did all the art for Hate, didn't he? Isn't that based on his comic book? I might be wrong. Might have just been... Anyway. Um, yeah, so, uh, the yeah, these are uh, all the punch board. I don't think we need to go through and punch all these punch board. But, uh... Let's go and take a look at the, the let's take let's take a look at the minis. That's what you guys want to see. You want to see the minis. That's what everyone wants to see. We want to see the minis and then maybe we can have a look at the god powers afterwards. But So I do like that Simon do this and put all the the figures in different colors. Um, rather than just relying on bases or whatever. And of course, they kind of have to do it because Eric Lang does this whole thing where he has the, the neutral guardians that you can get.
get on your team. Um, well, these are. Oh, do you know what? I should have got the. Uh, I should definitely have got the god cards out first because now I'm not sure who's orange. I guess this is Amon. Are you orange, Ammon? Uh, dare I open this with the box cutter and run the risk of scoring? Nope, it's fine. The plastic came apart. We have successfully opened up the god sheets. Okay, so red is Ammon. Orange is Ra. So Ra is the parrot god, uh, the sun and the light. So every faction has a number of warriors, a lot like all the other ones. Um, I think it feels a bit more like uh, Rising Sun because you only have six warriors in this. I feel like there were less warriors in that uh, than there were in Blood Rage, but I might be wrong. When you summon any figure, you may place a sun token on it. It becomes radiant. Your devotion reward for dominating or winning a battle in a region with at least one of your radiant figures is increased by one. Turn the sun token to Ra if the radiant figure is killed. Okay, so Ra gets three tokens and can essentially sort of create uh, special uh, figures, which can be guardians or warriors. Um, your god is also a figure, but you will never summon your god because your god can't die. So you presumably can't use this ability with your god. Um, but yeah, then you'll get extra... Yeah, so all the Ankh powers are the same on all the gods, which makes sense, I suppose... Um, but uh, yeah, so there's all these different powers that you can unlock that have different levels that you have to pay for but every god also has a unique power here so these are Ra's followers of the, the, the sun and the light oh gosh these Is that good? Oh. I think that's pretty cool, actually. I quite like these ones. But uh, I, I like these ones. I guess the, these must be Osiris, because he's the god of the dead, right? And these are like scaly men. He just kind of looks like, Oi! You know, it looks like one of those things you find like in a game or something, where it's completely still, and then you're sort of like, you're like, oh no, it's going to activate you. You know what I mean? Like it's just stood there, and you're like, oh no, what's going to trigger this guy? Yeah, so Cyrus is God of the Dead. Unfortunately, they made him out of a green plastic that my green screen doesn't wipe out. If you lose a battle, you may place or move one Underworld token into an empty non-water space in that region. So these are the Underworld tokens under my face here that you can't see. Uh, these are the Underworld tokens here, I think. So it says, uh, yeah, monuments and enemy figures cannot occupy an underworld space. When you see, when you use the summon figures action, you may summon one extra figure in any one underworld space. So you get extra figures and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm hoping, Haggers, that there'll be some, some fancy plastic tokens in the set as well. Um, so I don't have to punch all these cardboard tokens and... So here's Isis, Queen of the Th Queen of the Throne. Not really sure what that means, Queen of the Throne. But of course, if you want to be blue, you'll be playing as Isis. 
So for some reason it's the blue figures the green screen doesn't like. <laughs> okay. That's fine. I'll just uh we'll just look at them over here. Here we go. Look, he's a cool um He's got a scorpion holding a sun on his shield. Are you gonna focus over here? There we go. And a spear. I mean, the figures are great. Like, they are great. They're always good, though. In my experience, anyway. Who are these guys? Anubis the Embalmer. Judge of the Dead. Oh, look, they've got like little catchphrases as well. And Ammon's is Mysterious Forms. Isis is Protectress. Ra says uh, Radiance. Oh, I guess these are the name of their special abilities. So Anubis says the embalmer. It says whenever one enemy warrior is killed, you may trap them in the empty space below. Your god has plus one strength for each trapped warrior. Opponents must see capture enemy figures and hold them for ransom and get bonuses if you do. That's very cool. I guess that makes sense. Nice. Uh, we looked at Ra, we looked at Osiris, so... Amun is the only one we haven't seen. The uh, the goat god. Um, the hidden. So here's his figure, and he's got a power here that says, uh, "What's it say?" It says, once during each conflict event, you may play two battle cards in a single battle. Resolve, resolve both, adding their strength bonuses together. You must declare you're playing two card choices before your opponents commit to their card choices. I guess there's a space for a token here that you can flip or something to show you've done it. So Amon's got sort of sneaky, sneaky battle powers. Because presumably you never know when your opponent's going to do that either and get an advantage when you didn't think that they would get one. Yeah, Pekka, I really want to play Rising, Rising Sun again, actually. Okay, wait, we've got some more stuff here. What have we got? So we've got some little standees. These are the... I mean, you guys probably don't really care too much about this stuff. Um, the standees for the, uh, the action markers I was talking about. And also the um, a blue marker, and I don't know what that's for. A glass bead, possibly event tracker, probably event tracker. And I guess these plastic uh, unk tokens here are for the um, are for the. Devotion track that we looked at, you know, the, the one that's basically tracking victory. So there's like, yeah, there's like three ways to win. If you ever get to the top of the, uh, the devotion track, you just win right away. But also, if the, um, I think this is actually how I, I was, I got into talking about the event track because um, at the end of the fourth battle as well, if you're in the red zone, you're just eliminated from the game. Um, so you don't get to, so if uh, if all of the gods but one are eliminated, that person wins. Um, and then there's another way to win. Oh yeah, it's just at the end. I think whoever's highest on the devotion track at the end of the game, which is triggered here at the end of this fifth battle, um, that that will uh, be the other way to win. Bases so that we can claim guardians, of course. And another tray of minis. Here we go. Alright, so we got 
five giant god figures representing the different gods. And then the guardians here as well. And the number of guardians you use will depend on the player count. So I think uh, it's just one of each guardian in a two-player game. Two of each guardian in a three-player game. And I think in a four- and five-player game, it's two uh, big guardians and three little guardians. So you can see we've got three matching level one guardian models. But you'll only ever use one set of each. So, like, the guardians have different levels based on the, um, the Ankh powers. So what you'll do is you'll have your tokens here, and then as you unlock these unique powers up here, you'll move the tokens out. And when you reveal the Scarab, you can also have a Guardian. So you got level one, two, and three Guardians, which are, of course, based on the size of the minis, I assume. Actually, what kind of, how many Guardians do you get in the core set? It looks like possibly there's three different level one Guardians. Two level two and one level three set? Let's have a look at the Guardian cards and find out. All right, so these are player aids. You've got the actions on them as well as the uh, steps for a battle here as well to resolve in a battle. All right, so we've got one level three, two level three Guardians, two level two Guardians, and two level one Guardians. Huh. So the cat mummies are level one. And you can see they're crazy faces. And if you kill them, it's bad luck, of course, because the cats were brought in to protect the, the tombs of the gods. We've got Statet, which looks like some kind of cat person, cat elf person. Statet may enter regular movement in an enemy space by moving in one space away. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, movement in the game is actually really simple, which I quite like. The movement on the board is just, uh, you, can, you can't... You can move through anything, but you can't end your space in an occupied space. There's only one figure per space. That's it. Uh, so then we've got... So Statits and these guys are... So the mummies are level 2. Which is surprising because there's three mummy figures and I thought you didn't need three level 2 creatures. Ever. Uh, if your mummy is killed, it is immediately resummoned adjacent to your god. Okay, so they're like immortal. That's pretty cool. We got Apep. Apep may be summoned in any water space on the board. Water spaces count as part of each region they are adjacent to. Okay, that's pretty cool. So you can occupy water spaces. I guess there's some kind of advantage to that. Maybe I'm not. Maybe he. I'm not sure why that. Maybe it allows him to get next to buildings and things you might not otherwise be able to get next to. Because being adjacent to the buildings is really important. So then the level 3 ones are the giant scorpion, who's actually got a mummy in its back. When summoned or moved, point its claws at two spaces. At the start of a conflict event, destroy any, all adjacent monuments it's pointing at. What? Destroy adjacent monuments? That's nuts. Okay, so you can destroy the buildings? Wait, is, are they all monuments or is... Yeah, because it's obelisk, temple, and pyramid. Wow, that seems crazy. And then you got the Andro Sphinx. Enemy figures adjacent to the Andro Sphinx don't count their strength during battles. Oh, cool. It's a fancy, fancy looking Sphinx. So we can see how these things are realized, of course, by checking out the models here. These are the mummy cats. We, <laughs> there's three of them coming at you. <laughs> there's not enough food in my bowl. <laughs> I starve to death. <laughs> I wasn't lying this time when I said there was no food. That's cool. Uh, here's the mum. Well, here's the uh, the statet. That's cool. I like that figure. 
I like all of them. So there's a, there is of course a limited number of these in the game, so it's sort of like first come first served kind of thing. So you do want to think about whether you're going to try and un unlock a high level one quickly, or you know try to get one of the low level ones before it's taken. That's the Andro Sphinx. And of course it can't talk because it would be rude. Here is Apep, the crocodile guy that comes out of the ocean. He kind of looks a bit coy, doesn't he? He looks a little bit shy. He's like, hey. Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. And the giant scorpion who destroys monuments, apparently, which is crazy. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the typical reaction to a lot of Eric Lang sort of functions, though. You know, you're like, um, you're like, this seems crazy and broken and weird, you know, and then, of course... That's why the game is fun. Because everything's crazy and broken and weird. Wasn't Apep also a god, says Hegger. Uh, maybe. You're... You... I... I don't know. Hey, look, it's Osiris. This is a cool mini. Look at all the worshippers. That's cool. I think there was a crocodile god, but I can't remember its name now, so it's Hagger's. Well, if there was one, he's probably somewhere in here. So this is uh, Ra, the radiant god of parrots. I don't know why it's a little hard to make out the detail on the orange figures on this camera, but... He's got that proper high-up bird nose. I wonder if he'll come through better on, uh, on this camera here. Let's take a look. The color balance doesn't know what's happening. <laughs> cool, though. I mean, I like these giant god figures. They're pretty neat. Sobek is Kickstarter exclusive. That's the crocodile one, right, uh, Swat? This is Anubis, the Embalmer. I mean, this is, I think, actually the coolest of the three we've looked at so far. I guess they had to make Anubis look particularly cool because he's on the front of the box. I don't know if that had any uh, influence in their thinking. But yeah, the level of detail is just crazy. The 
What's he standing on? Is that like a little box with a tiny skull in it? It is. It's like a little man trapped in a box. Pekka's like, those blades are straight from hate. I didn't get hate, so... Uh, oh, this is the invisible um, Isis. So what's, uh, I mean, what's interesting is the way the, the gods work mechanically in the game is that they're basically, they have the same, they have the same actual power as one of their, their warriors, which seems a bit crazy because the warriors are like way smaller. So you'd think that the gods would have more power, but I guess maybe due to their divine nature, they're less powerful than, well, they're the same power. Every figure has one power, unless something uh, like it just says otherwise, but the gods can't die. The gods can never die. So any any time it's like remove all the figures or whatever, the gods can't are not affected by that. They're of course divine. And this is uh, Ammon, the hidden, the the mysterious one. And he knows it's hot out, so he brought a hat. Oh, look, he's got an ank on his staff. So, he's probably going to win Ankh. I'm going to see how many different ways I can pronounce that during this one stream. Yeah, I bet if you were good at painting, these would be great to paint because they're so detailed. And the plastic quality seems decent too. And the mold lines are relatively well hidden. Well, he does have one little mold mark on his cape, but we can forgive that, I think. They just come out really well. With great power comes great responsibility, Simon. If you're making great minis, then you also need to make great games. Can you pull it off? We'll find out in due course. Alright, um, I think that's all the miniatures from the course. Oh, no. There's a bag of something. Oh, these are the camels! Oh my god. I'm excited. I think there's multiple camel sculpts as well for the camel caravan. It's an invisible camel. How has this happened? <laughs> this is grey. What are you doing to me? Hang on. Then I guess we'll just have to look at the camels over here. Amazing detail on this camel mini. Honestly, best mini in the box, hands down. Are they all the same? No, they've all got different 
They're not all different, but they are different little backpacks of stuff. This was looking right at you. He's like, did your friend just put me down in the worst possible position for you? Good. Maybe there's just two sculpts? Nope. This camel has some kind of uh, supplies and it looks very proud about it. It's extremely pleased with its supplies. They should have had... Exactly, Chris. We can play this on Camel Game Wednesday. They should have had um, these camels on the front of the box. For sure. I mean, I think... Honestly, the, the lack of publicity around the camel caravan has been a, a major marketing mistake. 30 camels in this box, by the way. 30. 30 camel miniatures. Just say. Right, uh, what else do we want to see from the uh, corset here? We can have a look at these battle cards. See if they are, in fact, all the same for each god as I understand them to be. Alright, so here are the Isis cards. And here are the Osiris cards. Yes! They are all the same for each god. So, there you go. And once you play a battle card, you have to leave it face up so everyone can see, like, which one you've done. Chariots! It's just plus three strength. Miracle. No strength, but after battle resolution, gain one devotion for each of your figures that was killed, including during the Plague of Locusts. Ooh. And devotion is victory points, that's how we win! A drought. Your devotion reward for winning this battle is increased by one for each of your figures in the desert spaces in the region. There you go. So that's one to play uh, at the appropriate moment. Flood. When revealed, gain one follower for each of your figures in a fertile space. These figures can't be killed during battle resolution. Ah. So you don't get any combat strength, but you get a bunch of followers. And followers are good because you can buy Ankh powers and guardians with them. Build a monument. Ah, you can build monuments. You may sacrifice three followers to build and control a temple, pyramid, or obelisk anywhere in the region. And the Plague of Locusts. All players in the region simultaneously bid followers and sacrifice them. Kill all figures here except those of the player who sacrificed the most single followers that sounds risky Hager says there was a board game with other other board game with camels in it called merv we'll have to check that out then won't we at some other point uh, these are the the merging um powers by the way so when you get to the end of the third battle, which is uh, here, the the two players in last place, jo in a game of three or more, the two players in last place join together and fuse to become one uber player. And then you give them this to show the god that they merged with, uh, which is interesting. So, yeah, so you got your four actions there. Um, I don't know if you guys want me to talk any more about the rules, or if you just want to see what's in the boxes. But, um... Yeah, the four actions are just like, move your guys around the board. Summon guys based on how many monuments you're adjacent to that belong to you, or if they're neutral. Um... No, wait, that's not right. Maybe this... Maybe summoning figures is around how many monuments you're next to. And then gain followers, I think, is also a similar thing, being next to uh, next to the monuments. And then you unlock the Ankh powers by spending the followers. A number of followers equal to the level of the power you're unlocking.
Looks like uh, that last uh, god there, uh, I was struck down by the god who said summoning figure, your summoning figure thing was wrong. Yeah, Chris, everything is overheating. It's so hot right now. <laughs> These lights are killer. But um, yeah, you can only ever summon one figure at a time. Ooh. And then when you place them, you have to place them adjacent to other figures that you've got, which is crazy. Um, so let's have a think here. Let's get these guys back in their cardboard box. What did I do with it? Yeah, do we want to, uh, are we ready to move on from the corset? Did we see everything we wanted to see? Are we ready to look at, do you guys want to look at the scenario book some more? Are you ready to see the, uh, some, the whatever's next? Yeah, Hager's fans in this country are going to be sold out. Oh, that's nice. Look at that. They've given you a little, um, a little, uh, insert, uh, guide here. Um, I don't know if I've seen Simon do that before. So that's nice that we've done that. Now I have to keep the cardboard box, which I hate. Or get some kind of custom insert. Let's see if these things fit back into the box reasonably well. Huh. Have they left extra space to sleep the cards? Is that what that's for? So close to fitting. There we go. So we never did figure out what these are for, but I'm sure they're someone's unique power. All right. One box down. I mean, with uh, with ongoing climate change, there's no never been a better time to invest in aircon. <sighs> this was foolish. I should have taken the lid off first. Oh, look at the art around the inside. That's nice. More of that Adrian Smith characters up close see the crocodile does look really shy i'm not making it up it looks really coy like oh hi i just popped out the ocean to eat your warriors oh pekka that's so very generous of you thank you so much that's so very kind <laughs> i do need a fan but uh i <laughs> if i when i get a fan i will um I'll dedicate it to you, and also, I can't run it during the streams. <laughs> It'll be too loud. It'll ruin the audio. But thank you so much, that's so kind of you. I haven't actually seen the final printed rulebook for this either. Um, so, I wonder if they've changed anything from the work in progress rule book. It looks largely the same. Uh, Hagers, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe it'd be possible using a combination of noise gate, which is a audio tool to prevent quiet noise from coming through. It might be a possible to use a combination of a noise gate and a very quiet fan. Um, so, we'll have to see if we can figure that out. Hey, Eddie, thanks for joining, man. 
All right, so we got all the uh, the different powers at the back of the rule book there as well. This lo this looks basically the same as uh as the work in progress rule book that I read. Bam. All right. What are we going to open next? Which one of these is the best? The best one to look at. Probably the Tomb of Wonders, right? This is all the stretch goals and stuff, I think. We should probably look at that next. I think. Uh, hey guys, I'm not doing the bottom one. <laughs> I know that that's why you picked it, because it was on the bottom. <laughs> NVIDIA have a phenomenal background noise canceler now. Still in beta, but it seems to work extremely well. Even works on incoming audio. That's cool. I'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, the one they use for... The one they use for... Discord's pretty good, but it's very harsh. So it does tend to, like... It can often sound like if someone um, is going too loud or too quiet, it can often sound like they're just trailing. Either that, or it sounds like they just stop. So, you know, you have to be careful with these things. Like, the one in... I don't know how good the one in... The noise gate in OBS is. I imagine it's very basic. Like, you just set it up to the specific settings and then you set it off. Uh, I'll set it going, you know. All right, let's do. There's no shouting other than Heggers trolling me, so let's go for the uh, the Tomb of w Wonders, I guess. And we can find Sobek, the Kickstarter exclusive god, <laughs> the god of Heg of uh, kick of Simon Simon uh, resale value. Secrets chamber. It's, Tomb of Wonders is, is certainly raising my expectations here. Nice and high. I want to see what is in the Tomb of Wonders, and it better be wonderful. <laughs> well, we're on Tomb of Wonders now. We could do Pharaoh after, okay? Tomb of Wonders. The gods of Egypt, Ptah creator builder, and Sobek, lord of waters. So a bit of extra rules for these new gods. One's a bull, and I guess the other's the crocodile guy. And then it says so just is it, and then a bunch of new guardians as well uh, that I guess you can sub in for all of the other ones, including Bennu. Which, I, the, that's the bird one I think I liked. And also, Unut. Who I like because Unut is fun to say. Unut can only count as an extra summon from Pyramid Attuned. If she's actually summoned adjacent to one of your pyramids, otherwise it counts as your regular summon. Unut can maybe summoned adjacent to a f any figure on the board, no matter who it belongs to. She doesn't need to be summoned adjacent to one of your figures or monuments. Unut may also be summoned using the regular rules if the owner wishes. Okay. Ooh, there's something shiny. Aha! So we've got, um... We've got proper cardboard versions of the, uh... The flimsy boards from the core set. 
Although we've still not got uh, nicer versions of the gods boards. But I bet that's what's in here, right? In the divine offerings? Yeah. So this is all the, the prop... Remember I said... This is actually heavier, I think, than these other ones. This is just the hard cardboard versions of those other boards. Right, and I bet that's why we have a separate palace board here as well, so... <coughs> Alright, whatever you do, don't damage the game with your archaeological tool. Very carefully. What is going on with this plastic? <laughs> Get off. So we've got new Ankh tokens for the new gods. The god of brown and the god of green. We've got the merger cards for when they merge with the other players. We've got just an action board here, which is the um, proper cardboard version of the, act of the main game board. Thicker and better. Alright, what do you guys do? Ptah, the creator. What is your deal? After any opponent builds a monument, they must give you a follower. If possible, after you build a monument, gain all exalted follower tokens from here. Exalted followers count as two followers for all purposes. When sacrificed, they return here. Okay, that's kind of cool. So basically, it's a, um... He just kind of steals other people's followers, and he can get extra followers that way. And Sobek, the crocodile god of resale value, says, Your god may occupy water spaces. If you dominate or win a battle with your god, you may place a water token in the region. In any empty space adjacent to a river, water space, camel, or extended border, permanently changing it to a water space. Remove any camels on its edges. You cannot split a water region with this ability. So he's... That's interesting. He just creates... Uh, creates extra water there. Did I turn off the, uh, the green screen by accident? Oh, there we go. The Crocodile God, Lord of the Waters. And Ptah the Creator. Creator Builder. So he's got extra follower stuff. And then I think most of what's in here, we've got um, the combat decks for these two gods. We've got the guardian cards, so we'll take a look at those in just a minute. Uh, it looks like we've got uh, a bunch of plastic versions of the four set bits. So, is this taped? It is taped. Watch me. Okay, uh, be very, very careful at home with box cutters, children. Don't hurt yourselves. Leave it to a trained adult. Unfortunately, my trained adult isn't available to supervise me today, so you might all be about to witness a horrible accident live on stream. Wouldn't that be a treat? I'm going to have to re-divert Pekka's fan funds to uh, medical, emergency medical funds. And I cut myself with this box cutter. All right, there we go. Crisis averted for now. So what we've got are bases for the new gods. We've got shiny plastic follower tokens to replace the, uh, the punch board ones. <laughs> RIP my fingers. So these are pretty cool, actually. I like that they've got the gold um, on them because that's... Uh, Simon don't usually do that kind of thing. They, so that's kind of nice that they've done that. Um, so here are the action. These are, on the other hand, these are the action token stand-ins for the action tokens, which you can't really see because it's so bright. But um, I 
But, uh, yeah, they're, they're all this color, so I guess the skilled amongst you will probably want to paint these because they're supposed to be matching the colors of the actions, which is blue, red, green, and something else. Although I guess it doesn't really matter because they'll still be on the, the right tracks, you know? But, uh, yeah, they're all just like that. Uh, these are, I guess, the water tiles for Sobek. Um, the new water spaces he can put out. These have got to be Osiris's underworld tiles, which you can't see at all on this camera. But it's nice that they've put this gold paint on them. Um, for those of us who are terrible at painting and don't want... Uh, and here are those city tiles that I couldn't figure out uh, what they're for. Oh! We've got some uh, additional um, tokens here for the uh, the core set, including this um, these to this token here, which is... Uh, these are for the, the various unique powers of the gods, with the exception of this big red one here, which is a... A battle token. This goes to whoever triggered a battle, and then... Or the battle phase, rather. I, my camera's crashed. <laughs> okay, cool. Hello? Ah, I'm back! I'm back! For what it's worth. You need to see if I'm genuinely enthusiastic. Yeah, the uh, the battle token is for whoever triggered the battle phase. They get it, and then it's a one-off tiebreaker. So if you tie with someone, you can just spend it to to win the battle instead of tying. Um, and I guess these are all um the monuments. You've got your obelisks, your temples, and your pyramids there. And also you can, uh, it's got, um, you can put the little, uh, little Ankh tokens in. So like if you take control of one of these things, uh, I showed you on the cardboard in the core set how you would put the token in the, the groove at the bottom of the cardboard thing. But with these, they've actually got little, uh, spaces here. So you can actually put a little Ankh in and now, look, it's yours. You own this now. And that's fun. The toy value is extremely high. As is the case with many Simon games. <laughs> Extreme toy value. Very pleasing. Do enjoy. <laughs> Do enjoy toys. Otherwise, uh oh. What would I be doing here? Okay. Whoa. Not enjoying my fight with this insert. These are, uh, if you were wondering what these numbered tokens are, these are the. Um, these mark the regions in the game. Uh, you put them out according to the scenario setup, and they're the order in which the regions will fight during the battle phase. So you'll trigger region number one first, and so on. And when you create a new region with camels, you mark it with the uh, highest number, so the last region to activate. So you know if you create a new fourth region, that will be region four. But then after you mark that as region four, you can swap that number four with one of the other region numbers in the game. So that's optional. So there's like this whole sort of order of things triggering that you might want to consider, um, which is pretty cool. And these are double-sided as well, so that's cool. Angry Al says, where are you from? Angry Al, I'm broadcasting this live from London, England, but I'm from Canada originally. Okay, so we can put the battle cards back. But we'll hang on to these guardian cards, which we're going to check out. Actually, I think supposed to be here. There we go. Alright, did you guys see enough of that? Enough of these tokens here? Was that sufficiently satisfying? Let me know if there's anything in chat that you want to see in particular. Otherwise, we're going to go straight on into the... Uh, straight on into the miniatures and these cards here. There's all these grooves in this bottom insert. It looks like these things are supposed to like slot in in a specific way. But I don't know what it is. So 
I don't know. Anyway, here we go. Time to see some miniatures from the Tomb of Wonders. <laughs> so none of those places prepared Mike for the high temperatures of the moment. Well, Difter Canada would get very humid in the summer, but we had aircon, so, you know. Ooh, look at all these toys. So many toys. Because <sighs> what I really don't have enough of is miniatures. So we haven't got to the... Um, the Pharaoh expansion yet, which which adds the priests. So, uh, but this has got priests in it for Sobek and for Ptah. These are the uh, the followers of Sobek here. Um, there we go. I don't know how well they're going to show up on the uh, the green screen, but actually they were doing okay, weren't they? So, I mean, let's at least see if we can focus them in. Oh, do you know it stopped? The music stopped. I was like, it suddenly seems very quiet, still. Can we see him down here too? No, he's completely invisible. <gasps> but there we go, he's got a club and he's gonna club you. A crocodile club. He's the follower of the crocodile god with his crocodile club. Number 35. <laughs> so these are the craft followers of the craft the world builder god, the craftsman god, so of course they have horns around their waist because he's a bull, and also they're armed with a hammer. These guys actually look pretty cool. I like that they've got two uh, weapons as well. That's neat. We can see the uh, the priests, which are for an for an expansion, the uh, the Pantheon expansion, where you can essentially, what I understand is these are kind of, they're kind of, it's kind of like a little worker placement thing where you can send these guys over there, and then they'll uh, let you do additional actions uh, when you send them to the palace to talk to the pharaoh. Oh, he's got like a crocodile hat with a crocodile tail on it. So he follows so back. Oh, that's cool. I actually have a bunch. I realize now I actually have a bunch of um, Egypt games in my collection. Because I've got this and I've got um, Cleopatra and the Society of Architects. And isn't also Tigris and Euphrates, isn't that set in Egypt? Alright, so we've got a bunch of uh bunch of guardians here as well. So let's uh let's go through their cards and have a look at what they do. So this is uh Neb Neckbet Neckbet. During a regular move, Neckbet can move any number of spaces. So usually when you trigger the move action, you can move all of your figures on the board. That's your god, your warriors, and your guardians. You can move them all zero to three spaces. So that's each figure can move zero to three spaces. And the only rule uh, is that you can't end your movement on a water space unless you have, unless you're the crocodile guy or whatever. Uh, but you can't end your move on a water space. You can't end your move, move on a space occupied by someone else. So neck bet is a level one guardian. So budget guardian, but it doesn't look budget to me. It looks kind of badass. I assume this is neck bet. There you go. All right, who's next? It's 
Snake Man. Wadjet. <laughs> Wadjet. If Wadjet is your only figure in a battle, it has plus one strength and your devotion reward for winning is increased by one. Hmm, interesting. So he likes to go it alone. More effective in the late game when there's more regions. I think. Well, I suppose there'll be a lot more figures too, so maybe not. Interesting. Is this Wadjet? I think this is Wadjet here. Can we focus a little bit? Better? This is the best we're going to get. They are cool figures, though. I'm just going to keep saying that until I get into trouble. Here's uh, Wadjet's bigger brother, um, Sir Cat. That creepy tail face is cool. I like that. I like this one. What's it do? If you win a battle with Sir Cat, you may move her to an empty, non-water space in a region higher in the conflict order, if able. Oh, that's cool. So she just sort of continues to participate in battles if she wins. That's scary. But that makes sense, because look at her. She's creepy. Is this her? Oh, yeah. The face also has a tail. Uh, a stinger, which is like its nose. She's like a scorpion. And she's got this stinger with a face. Cool. And a huge sword. I'd be all about this guardian if I was playing. I mean, you can only get one... One guardian per type present in the game, but... Oh, Unnut's a rabbit! Cool. Unnut may be summoned adjacent to any figure. I hope that's more powerful than it seems. There are three Unnuts available. The, uh, the flowers underneath the cloak are pretty cool. Like, I bet this figure would look great painted. Well, it, the when you summon a, a figure, you have to put it adjacent to... Actually, I, there, I think there are actually two restrictions. So maybe, I think when you summon a figure, it has to be adjacent to one of your figures. Yeah, that's right. It's got to be adjacent to one of your figures, um, which can be a little complex because adjacent means in the same region as, as well as in a space next to. So if your figure was next to spaces, that are in another region, which I would demonstrate if I had the board from the corset out. Oh, well, look, there's a a thing here. So, like, um, you can't really see too well on this diagram because this is not the point of it, but the river prevents adjacency. So, like, this space here is not adjacent to the space on the other side of the river. Um, so I think you have to place your figures adjacent to figures you already have on the board. So I suppose maybe... It, uh, Unit's power is actually powerful because it can go and be next to opponents. It could pop into existence in a region where you don't have any presence at the moment. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Chris uh, and I have arrived at the, the same conclusion. I don't know how good that would be, necessarily. But, there are two kinds of victory in battle in this game. There's, um, there's winning the actual battle which is when there's multiple players in a region and they have to fight. But there's also something called dominance, where if you're the only player in the battle, then you just dominate and you get a bunch of victory points for just 
controlling the whole zone and being the only one there, so... Yeah. If Una prevents domination, then it's probably worth it. If it just pops into existence and stops that, existence and stops that happening, that probably is pretty, pretty good. All right, we've got Hekka next. Hekka's Egyptian cousin. Instead of performing Hekka's regular move, you may kill him to gain three followers. Huh, that's interesting. Of course, when they die, they just go back to your pool and you can summon them again. And three followers is a lot of followers. That's pretty good. That seems really good to me. I have all the spears and an onk. I have three spears. Actually, that's not a spear. I don't know what that is. This is my crescent moon staff. It's cool to learn about all these different mythological creatures, though. Okay, Heggers, I will read that one out because that was pretty good. So, instead of performing Hekka's regular move, you may kill him to gain a heck a lot of followers. There you go. <laughs> uh, Medjet is Hekka wearing a blanket. If Medjet is part of a battle resolution, the winner gains followers instead of devotion from winning. If Medjet is part of a battle resolution, the winner gains followers instead of devotion from winning. Hmm. Well, that would be a great way to get a lot of followers. But you'd have to be careful with it because, of course, devotion is how you win the game. And if you fall too far behind, you could be eliminated. That could be a double-edged sword. But it could be very good. Um, if you use Midget for, like, one battle. Oh, actually, though, if Midget is part of a battle resolution, the winner gains followers. It doesn't say you if you win. So, actually, you could use Midget to sabotage your enemies if you know you're not going to win a battle. So, your enemies would get, like, a bunch of followers, which would be good, but they wouldn't get devotion, which is bad. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm... What ha oh yeah, yeah, the, that's something else. Um, do you remember I showed you guys how the player elimination works? Uh, if you don't pass the, out of that red devotion zone by the end of the fourth battle, you're, you're eliminated from the game. And uh, it is possible for every player to be eliminated from the game at that stage, in which case Egypt becomes an atheist country and everybody loses. <laughs> Just want to touch your hair. Cool. So that's Medjet. Uh, and I think that's this whole tray, actually. I think we've seen everyone in this tray, have we? No, we haven't seen whoever the swan is. Pharaoh Mummy. If your Pharaoh Mummy is killed in battle, reclaim all of your used battle cards at the end of that battle. Well, that's pretty good. This is kind of like a backup. If you play a good card and then still get beat. Is Medjet optional, Chris? I don't know. I don't think so. It doesn't say you may or anything. So I think you have to be careful with that. Here's the Pharaoh mummy. It's like a regular mummy, but also a god king. So, I guess it's better than a regular mummy. And that's this tray. So now we get to see 
the next tray. Oh, all the big figures. Well, I guess we'll take a little uh, break from the... Uh, what is this? I genuinely don't know what this is. Not for standing characters. Who's this guy? Holy cow. Why is there only one of him? Well, I've got one of these. If you know what this is, uh, leave a comment in chat or on the video in the future and uh, then we'll know. Ah, Deltari says the Two God Fusion Token. I didn't know there was a Two God Fusion Token. But uh, I just tried it and the God didn't fit on... Oh wait, does he go on the other side? Oh yeah, okay. There we go. So now I guess you're a... Um, a merged God. There we go. I have merged with this plinth and become the God Plinth. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so, here is Ptah, God Creator. He's got an Ankh, so that he can continue to win, and also some gems. I mean, I'd be scared if I saw him coming at me. Good news is he's only strength one. Just like all the figures. There certainly seems to be fewer high strength figures in this one than there are in, typically in the um, the Eric Lang games. All right, so the crocodile's invisible, so we'll look at him over here. But he looks very angry. He comes out of the ocean and gets you. He's got some kind of big axe, which is cool. Ah! <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't want to go up against this guy, so I would not, uh, I don't think I would, uh, attack this re the region with this guy in it. Cool sort of scorpion headdress thing going on there as well. That's neat. Cool. The god figures continue to be awesome. They've done a good job on those. Alright, we've got... Kepri, which is a scarab. A giant scarab. When you use the gain follower's action, you may first summon or move Kepri adjacent to any monument on the board. Okay, so when you gain followers, you gain a follower for each monument that is neutral or under your control with a figure with one of your figures adjacent to it so uh this could be used to gain a follower real quick so you could reposition capri to sort of ensure you get the most out of your gain followers action i guess the premise is that it flies around lands next to the monuments and recruits people to your cause is that a little face? I don't know what that's supposed to be. I 
it kind of, yeah, it kind of reminds me of like a, a flying fruit of some kind. I think it's the little pattern on the shell. It just kind of looks like orange peel or something. Who's next? Bez! It's Bez with the invisible headdress. Bez is angry about something. He's got his eye on you. There's some kind of really interesting story, actually, because this guy's got eyes everywhere except on his face. I mean, he does have eyes, but it's like there's no eyes. Do you know what I mean? Interesting. Your devotion reward for winning Pyramid Majority in a region where you have Bez is increased by one for each pyramid you control in the region. Okay, so he basically rewards you for holding the pyramid monuments. I mean, that's good. Like, uh, whenever, whenever a conflict is resolved in a region, whether it's via domination or not, you, uh, if you have the majority of a specific kind of monument, you get bonus devotion. So, there you go. So more victory points. He looks like, a, I don't know, he's supposed to be short, but he's actually really large. <laughs> well, Difter, it wouldn't take me long to paint all these minis, actually, because what I would do is I'd just dunk them into a pot of paint, and then I'd be done, because um, that's probably about equal to what I could do if I tried any harder anyway. Benu can't ever be killed. Benu. It's like a phoenix if a phoenix was a heron. I like Benu. Me and Benu are going to be friends. Can't be killed. Perfect. Invincible bird soldier. Love it. Yeah, a nice ink wash would be good, actually. Or like a sort of a, a splash of color, and then like a little ink wash to sort of match, to bring that color out. Here's Babby. Babby's like, did you say something? You say something to me? You talking to me? During conflict events, Babby also counts as an obelisk under your control. That's good. Contend that obelisk majority devotion award. I guess at that point, because Babby's a level three follow a level three guardian. You'd probably want to acquire Babby when you've got some obelisks, so you can increase an established majority to maximize points gain. Or devotion gain. Points, points, points. That's how we win. It's just a big thumping club for thumping. This is why he counts as an obelisk. He's literally armed with one. Ah! Oh, his little tail. And his weirdly, like, human legs. I suppose he's a monkey. We're quite closely related. Next up, it's Griffin. Griffin has plus one strength for each of your temples on the board. Oh, that's potentially really good. So if you get control of those temple monuments. And uh, I was just saying how rare it seemed to be plus one strength in this one. So. There you go. Getting a, a strong Griffin could be a big deal.
Mer. Looks like it's about to give you its paw for food. Like food, please. I require feeding. Ten kilograms of kibble a day. I'm very large. Our penultimate creature here is Towerette, which is a hippo. Of course, we know hippos to be the most dangerous animals in all of Africa. So it's got plus two strength for each god in its region. Your god never knew what hit it when it was hit by hippo. It's actually killed Sobek and it's wearing Sobek as a coat. It's also, I guess, the hippo, part hippo, part fertility god? <laughs> am I gonna get, am I gonna get in trouble on YouTube for showing this miniature? <laughs> it's even, like, even this club is a, is a little crocodile. There's clearly like an enormous amount of story about whatever this is in Egyptian mythology that I just don't understand. It's cool though. I love these crazy creatures. That's awesome. And finally, we've got this special one here who is so, somehow some kind of unique guardian. I guess this is revenge of uh, Sobek after the, the hippo uh, Towerette killed it. It came back. And it was like, I'm undead, Sobek. Petsuchos has strength three and occupies two adjacent spaces. At the end of each conflict event, Petsuchos is given to the player with the lowest devotion. It goes into their pool if control changes. Right, so there's only one and it changes sides. Hmm... Interesting. Two adjacent spaces. So does it, have a, it doesn't have a bigger base, though. But the mini is crazy. It's wearing corpses. Look at that. Just tons of corpses everywhere. It's a bunch of mummies riding it, I guess. Or maybe it's got them in its backpack for lunch. I don't know, is that like uh, some kind of pharaoh driving it? But it's pretty cool. I guess it's a shame about the obvious visible gap on its arm between the two pieces. Are you talking about this one? Uh, this mini here? Yeah, I mean, yeah. There? Yeah, I guess, so. I, I mean, that stuff's never really bothered me, but that's possibly because I don't paint them. Um, I reckon if, uh, if you're a serious miniatures person, you'd probably look, be looking at that and go, all right, time to break out the modeling putty. Speaking of Simon, I've been reading about the whole thing with pledges by people from Norway being cancelled in wake of shipping problem with X-Men United. Uh, Eddie, I haven't heard anything about um, about that, but I mean, I have heard about the shipping problems, which is, of course, a real uh, a real issue at the moment for for the board gaming world. Um, But, you know, fingers crossed it'll all get resolved. 
I mean, apparently it will. For my invader says, hi Mike, hi everyone, taking a break from studies to check out this these awesome minis. Yep, once again, a whole cadre of awesome minis. I'm excited to check out the Pantheon expansion, actually, and see some more of the, uh, the gods in there as well. The god minis, but uh, that was a nice selection in the... Uh, so I think that's it, actually, for Tomb of Wonders, pretty much. Uh, do let me know if there was something in this box that we missed that you wanted to see. But I think that just about covers off all the sort of the cool and unique bits um, in here. We've got some extras here for pharaohs, so we'll look at those when we get to pharaohs. Um, Hey, we're back. It's, uh, it's, yeah, the, uh, it's Anubis, Guardian of the Underworld, who is keeping our, uh, our stream locked up on his player board, and I have to spend followers every time I want to bring it back. Sorry, Anubis. Or, sorry, sorry to everyone else. I should have angered Anubis. I don't know what I did, but, um, once I find out, I'll make amends. We'll sacrifice something. What kind of board game would we have to sacrifice to please Anubis? Not Ankh, oh, I just got it. I haven't played it yet. Maybe uh, Anubis has a deal similar to Death, where we I can pick a game to play against him. And if I win, I can have my soul back. Right, um, you guys want to see Pharaohs next, right? Um, I mean, I know that uh, actually that was just Heggers um, trolling me, but we can do... Uh, can do pharaohs next. There's no reason not to. Um, I don't think that uh, divine offerings is all that exciting. I think it's just tokens and um, tokens and uh, thicker boards for the the gods. I think pantheon is just more gods and warriors and stuff. But it might be nice to see the extra god abilities in there. And of course, guardians. I imagine is more guardians. I mean, it doesn't seem like we need more Guardians after going through that Tomb of Wonders. But yep, we've got another uh, another five Guardian types in the Guardians box. The war between hippos and crocodiles continues. Uh, Kujo Painting, I would absolutely say this is Fantasy Flight's best Kickstarter yet. Pharaoh then. Pharaoh it is. So this is the one that adds actual new game mechanisms. I mean, the others obviously add new game mechanisms in the sense that uh, additional gods or additional guardians add new abilities, which of course can are so, you know, if you know Eric Lang, you'll know that those will be significant enough to meaningfully change the way the game is and feels. Um, but this adds sort of unique mechanisms that are not just sort of variations on the um the abilities of the guardians and the gods this adds a, an additional board with new action spaces and a new sort of type of figure that uh is akin to a worker i think like a worker placement situation yeah Ugh, get out of here, plastic. Nobody likes you. Eh. I totally got that where I was aiming for. And you'll never know any different. Okay, so... We've got some new buildings, which are sphinxes. We've got 
some other tokens, which are these ones. So new monuments now, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I haven't actually read the rules for Pharaoh, so I don't really know exactly how this works. But, uh, oh, Thoth. Is Thoth a god? We've got one golden Pharaoh, three Anubis priests. And Thoth priests. Now, I was pretty convinced Thoth was culminate was a... Uh, Thoth was a, um, HP Lovecraft thing, but actually now that I think about it, he could have got it from here. I could have stolen that from Egyptian mythology. I'm bad at Egyptian mythology, so I wouldn't actually know how to make that. But uh, we've got all our corset priests, plus I guess a bunch of priests from... The, I guess what is probably the Pantheon expansion because the priests for Sobek and Ptah were in, in the Tomb of Wonders so there we go one Pharaoh death token four Pharaoh tokens some new player aids we've got Pharaoh cards political cards and a palace dashboard with action spaces on it so that's cool and uh, we have got our thick palace dashboard here, which I guess they couldn't fit in the Tomb of Wonders. Um, or perhaps they didn't want to, because maybe not everyone who got the Tomb of Wonders got the palace expansion, which actually makes sense. All right. Uh, Eddie says, I'm curious to hear how Ankh's gameplay will compare to Blood Rage. Um, yeah, me too, Eddie, uh, in the sense that, um, I have, I have, of course, played Blood Rage, um, and I have not played Ankh. They look very different in terms of how they, they play. Um, in Blood Rage, you know, you've got, uh, Rage, which is a resource that you spend on actions. In Ankh, you don't have a resource to purchase actions. You just get to take one or two actions on your turn. Uh, you will always get to take two unless you trigger an event with your first action, in which case you'll have one. So it seems like in terms of action selection, um, it's very... It's going to be about very careful timing, I think. You know, I think it's... A, it's I think every action is going to be really, really important. Positioning of your figures when to summon, that kind of thing is going to be very, very important. And so I reckon it'll be a lot about timing. Um, I think that'll be a huge factor in this game, which of course is also very important in Blood Rage, but I think um, in this it'll be, I think this will feel less flexible than Blood Rage. I think I think you'll you'll have to sort of plan and commit to your actions a lot more carefully in this. Not careful carefully is the wrong word. I think it will feel more I mean, because it is very important in Blood Rage, uh, the order in which you do things and trigger things and whatnot. I don't want to make it sound like it's not, but I feel like uh, in Blood Rage you'll probably feel like you have more um, more flexibility. Whereas in this, I think you'll feel more like uh, you've got a million things you want to do, and really there's going to be like one or two things that you can do, you know? And it's going to be, it's going to feel like a really sort of excruciating choice every time. That would be my guess. Of course, uh, I haven't had a chance to play yet. Ah, oh, this tape on four sides. Come on now. All right, so we'll have a look at these cards in a minute. But it does still have that trademark sort of Eric Lang thing where, you know, it's um, all of the powers and everything seem huge and game-breaking. Oh, thanks for hanging out, Difter. Thanks so much for watching. 
So here's our golden pharaoh. He's very shiny, especially here under the green screen lights. Difter will probably be back tomorrow for Soul Raiders, I think. Um, so, if you are about, there will be another stream tomorrow, I suspect. Making up for some time. Seeing as the set appears to be working in the new setup, so we can progress. That's a cool guy. I like this one. I don't know what it does, but it's cool. So we've got our core set priests first, I think. Isis. It's really shiny. There's a priest, priestess of Isis. What's she holding? Is it like a little... It's an urn. She's holding like a little urn or something, I think. This is the wrong thing. Hang on. Where are my controls at? There we go. We got Priest of Ra. It's like, behold my orange plastic that doesn't show up well on their green screen for some reason. Let me bring him over here. Just to give this camera a headache with color balance. But everyone's welcome into the Temple of Radiance. Follow the god Ra. With open arms! See, our temple is one of hugs and joy. Give us dominance points. This is the priest of uh, Ammon? Anon? The mystery goat one. Actually, it's a priestess again, but she's wearing some kind of face covering, so I can't really make out her features. But uh, he actually had a, a, a sort of a head thing like this, didn't he? Her god, so that's kind of fitting, isn't it? Cool. And then Anubis is here. That's another Ankh! Look, the top of his staff is an Ankh! Ankh, I knew it! He's also standing on a corpse. He looks undead, actually. This guy looks like he's... He might be a bit of a skeleton man. He's got... Has he got skelly men coming out from under his cloak? Yeah, he does. Everything's very grim and underworldy here over in Anubis's Guardians of the Dead, or whatever he's called. <laughs> Good morning, Ralph. Welcome to the stream. Thanks for stopping by. And this is Osiris, his priest, the actual god of the dead. Before he was betrayed or something. And I, I do wish I knew more about that plot line, but here we go. Alright, now the rest of these are for gods that we haven't looked at yet, so I'm going to have to get that uh, rule book out so I can tell you who they belong to. We've got um, Set. The Priests of Set. I remember Set, actually. I feel like Set was one of the major gods within the Egyptian pantheon, although I could just be making that up. I'm not the most knowledgeable. But. Oh, 
Was Set a snake? I feel like Set might have been a snake. This is Bastet, the cat god. Or cat goddess. So she's the 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 lion, the tiger, the lion. The lion is actually the the priest. The handler's just there to make sure that the priest doesn't get out of control and eat someone. My camera's crashed again. My computer's not having a good day. It's hot and it's bothered. So next up we've got Thoth. God of Justice, maybe? Are those scales? Or... I don't know. She looks like she's holding scales or something. Is she gonna show up on the green screen? Oh, she's very bright. And hard to see. Quite a... I like this one, actually. It looks cool. Quite a sort of smaller, but more delicate miniature, I think, than the others. Um, this is Horus. I remember Horus as well. I feel like Horus and Set are quite major ones. I guess it's good that they've been included. Set is the brother of Osiris. Oh, that's cool. Is Set the one that betrayed him? If you have Osiris and Set in the same game, are they like super mad at one another? I can't believe you betrayed me. There we go. So that's Horus. And then this is Hathor, who's clearly like the god of mad raves, which is awesome. They call Hathor the, uh, the burning man. Apparently, Set is known for being the baddie in Tomb Raider 4, which I think was um, a little late for me. I think I only played Tomb Raider 1 and 2. Uh, we've got some little extras here. Do you guys want to look at the cards? Unfortunately, I can't really talk about the rules of this box because I don't really know them. Um, so uh, we could go through these political cards but i don't really know what they do gain two followers for i mean it looks like they, they're just kind of like additional bonus cards really um like the the other ones um in the sense that uh so this is they give you like extra actions like gain two followers for each of your figures in fertile green spaces in your god's region that seems good um Here's another random one. Destroy and rebuild. Move one of your monuments to a space adjacent to any figure. Also very, potentially very powerful. Shifting the balance of the game. Um, you could get a, a bunch of points that way. So there are duplicates of them as well. I don't know if they're... I don't know how we come by them though. Second action may be the same as your first action this turn. Move that marker twice. Neat. Pyramid affinity. God, I love pyramids. Move each of your figures that are adjacent to your pyramids and sphinxes up to five spaces. 
Yeah, up to five spaces. Temple Affinity. The Order of Mott. Gain one follower for each of your used battle and political cards, including this one. So I guess you gain these political cards through one of the actions on the uh, the pair the board. We can actually have a look at the board and see see what the actions are. So we've got. Is this gonna fit in here? Sort of. The Chamber of Law. Take one political card or remove one of your used or unused political cards from the game. Make each opponent lose a devotion. The War Room. You may replace one of your monuments with a Sphinx and gain the Sphinx Riddle bonus. Don't know what that is, but that's I like that there's a Sphinx Riddle. Court of Civil Affairs. Take a political card and gain two followers. In the Throne Room. Take one political card and move your Pharaoh up to three spaces. And move the Pharaoh up to three spaces. So perhaps, oh, then there's the political deck. There's just space for the political deck at the bottom here, so. Um, I guess we can kind of piece together how this is supposed to work. But if you don't want to use the, um, the cardboard punch monument tokens, because you've got all the fancy ones from the Team of Wonders, we've also got some Sphinx in here to represent those monuments. So these match the others. And they have a little uh, space in their back as well for the uh, for the Ankh tokens. So you can slot your Ankh token in there and have your own Sphinx monument. With his little tail. And it's going to ask you a riddle. Which I guess come from these Pharaoh cards. So whoever's the current Pharaoh will change up the Sphinx riddle. So this is Amenhotep. Beloved, the devotion reward for dominating... Winning a battle and winning each monument majority in Amotep's region is increased by one. So I guess we're going to put our golden pharaoh out on the board and he's going to move around. So he's got a region. The Sphinx riddle is reveal political cards from the top of the deck equal to the number of Sphinxes you control. Pick one of them and discard the rest. Okay, cool. So that's like additional sort of unique powers and things that you could use. I don't know what this is. It just says Pantheon Extras. Oh, that's for Pantheon, not for this. This is not Pantheon, this is uh, the Pharaoh expansion. Cool. So I think that just about covers the Pharaoh expansion. Um, yeah, I like uh, I like extra mechanisms and things that can shake up the, um, the balance of the game, so I'm well on board with that, with all of that. Oh no, where are my Sphinxes going to go? What is the meaning of this insert? Go, Sphinxes! Go! Deploy! Can I come out of the door? The Sphinxes are shy. They don't want to come out. Pantheon next? You guys want to see Pantheon next? Did you want me to go through all the pharaohs? I assume not. So if you want to see them. Um, there's also a player aid here that just uh, outlines what's going on here with the, the political cards. Once per action, a player can play one political card before or after resolving their action. And the player reclaims their used... When a player reclaims their used battle cards, they also reclaim their used political cards. Okay, so I thought battle cards were actually used for the whole game, but I guess they're not. I guess you can reclaim them somehow. I don't remember reading that in the rulebook at all, but... Um, I did read a work in progress one when the Kickstarter was online, so there you go. Uh, the Sphinx counts as all types of monument at the same time, Ogilus, Pyramid, and Temple, except for Monument Majority, when it counts as its own fourth type. Ooh, it's like an uber monument. That's the sphinxes are part cat, which is why it won't come out the box. All right, Pharaoh expansion. Neat. All right, who's next? Where are we gonna go from here? We got. Uh, Only a few left, actually. Well, three left. We can do 
I mean, and nobody really cares about the uh, divine offerings, do they? Because those are just the thick god boards. I mean, we'll take a look at those. We'll go. We'll we'll look at all three boxes, but uh, we can do um, guardians or pantheon next. Yeah, the sphinxes are a bit self-conscious about the fact that they're they lost their their nose. The top one, the guardian set. All right, cool. So these are additional guardians. So we've got um, more minis and more guardians to just randomize the game. So it seems to me that in the game you only use one level one, one level two, and one level three guardian. So. If you've got all of this stuff, you're going to have to play a lot of games of Ankh. So, here's hoping it's good. The best of the trilogy, question mark? Well, we'll have to play it to find out. What's in this thing's mouth? It looks like some kind of, like, weird pink tongue hanging out here. Alright, so what do we got? We got Guardian set. Ah! Oh, so is this giving us, uh... This is giving us the, the rules, and there's a tiny amount of flavor text as well. While all gods possess power and responsibility beyond that of mortal ken, they themselves were never created equal. Not all bestrode the world like the mighty sun, or commanded the realm of the dead, or even represented all of feline kind in their regal majesty. The lesser gods and demons knew their place, and divided that their survival and divined that their survival would hinge on levying favor with one patron that would dominate the cosmos when all was done. It was not a matter of followers or that their duties were of any lesser import, yet the whims of fate and the cosmic tide had left them without grand monuments and legions of devoted followers. Such was the nature of divine existence. For the patron deities that grant their succor, these guardians ply their trades in their patrons' name, names, adding to their own grandeur and protecting their devoted followers as their own. Serving the mighty was their truest path to enduring this war to end all wars. So these are uh, these guardians are based around the concept of um, it seems of uh, sort of beings that were slightly more than your standard mythological creatures, you know, famous um, deities or stuff, lesser gods almost who were not as high up as the gods we've seen so far, but. Slightly grander, I suppose, than the uh, than the average guardian. What? 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 Okay, so we've got more cat people, which I can get behind. I do enjoy. In fact, I think uh, if I if I can have a cat at every tier of the uh, the guardian. Um, The guardian tree if i can just play one with three three cats a level one two and three cat guardian then i will be pleased i'm trying to open this without ripping the cards but the plastic is being very disagreeable there we go all right so our first guardian here is mad math debt not mad fat, math dad. And math dad says, if you have math dad in battle, double the followers you gain from playing the flood battle card. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, that's uh, that's all about perfect timing, isn't it? Here's Mafdet.
I mean, it's like a lion warrior. I'm into it. If you're a cool cat soldier, I want you in my army. And it's like scythe. It's got some kind of scythe weapon. Yep. Let's have to get cool flooding cards. Pazuzu has plus two strength while adjacent to at least two monuments. Ooh, that's tricky to organize. Does Pazuzu have a scorpion dick? And faces in its knees? Yes, it does. Both of these things are true. Well, there you go. Sometimes it's just like that. This is the demon from The Exorcist. Well, now you know why that girl, that poor girl was so troubled. It's like, he doesn't have, he has like hands as well. They're not like proper feet. They're like hands. Where his feet should be. The first uh, Exorcist film was Pazuzu. I think I knew that and then forgot. Well, here's Amhe, who is not a good boy. Amhe is a bad boy, as you could tell from the look on its face. After Amhe ends its regular move, you may move any adjacent enemy figures one space. Yeah, because they're scared of it, because it's freaking weird. Here's Amhe. It's like a starving dog with snakes coming out of its neck. Which, you know, makes perfect sense, of course. Bringer of plagues. I guess. A little mole line around the head there. That's no good. Maybe they're getting a little lazy with this one. I don't know. They both like that. Uh, the other one's a bit better. Barf, barf, arf. I like that snake at the top there. It looks like it's singing. It's like, ah! I'm going to be a famous star one day. All right, we got Abbott, the uh, escalation in the hippo crocodile war. It's part bear and it has corpses coming out of its chest. It may occupy water spaces. If Emma ends its regular move in a water space, it may kill an adjacent enemy figure. Nasty. Including the hippo thing. Because that's an enemy, if that's an enemy figure. Yeah, it looks like it's got the legs of a hippo, the arms of a bear, and the head of a crocodile, crocodile and then snakes for teeth. I mean, it also has teeth. Snakes for tongue. And corpse is coming out of its chest. Or maybe they're just the bones of its enemies that got caught up in its chest hair. Pretty scary. And that's why it can just instigate one enemy piece. Oh yes, level three cat warrior. I'm all about this. It's, it's, um, Thundercats guy. Damn it. Tight, tight. Mm, forgot his name. Shesmu. Shesmu 
enemy guardians can't be summoned into Shezmu's region. That's good. Enemy guardians in Shezmu's region have no strength and no abilities. That's amazing. He just shuts down everyone else. That's awesome. He's like, I am the ultimate warrior. Which makes sense because he's he's pretty ripped for a cat warrior. And he's got a cool beard. He kind of reminds me of Jason Momoa. I don't know why. Maybe it's the braided beard. I don't think Jason Momoa has a braided beard. It just kind of has that energy to it. Lion-O. That's right, Eddie. It was Lion-O. He's just got a big-ass sword. And he's going to come up and smack you with it. And shut down your guardians. There you go. And that is the Guardians set. So, if you didn't have enough Guardians from everything else... Well, I suppose this will be available at retail, right? That's kind of the premise, isn't it? Like, um... If you didn't get the, uh, the the Tomb of Wonders or whatever, you're going to be able to get this at retail. So, if you want more Guardians, that is the set you will be able to acquire with more Guardians in it. So, I guess we move on to the Pantheon, which is another expansion that will be available at retail with the uh, additional gods that you can play as in it. So, this is going to have Set and all those other ones that we saw before. Um, Thoth set or it's horse looks badass actually horse looks awesome Bastet and Hathor the goddess of raves oh my god actually the goddess of love I was not far off yeah The War of the Gods did not begin with any formal declaration. Instead, it was the slow realization that as devotion to one god waxed, power to the others waned. Thus it was that the last holdouts who sought to distance themselves from the fray took to the battlefield in their own bids for dominance. What had begun as jostling in a minor power struggle was drawn into all the mighty has drawn all the mightiest deities across the Egyptian pantheon. And in the end, there could only be one. Oh my god, this is like... This is like Egyptian deity... Um... Oh no, brain, why do you fail me? Why do you fail me? What's the movie where there can only be one? Come on, help me out here. And I'm not talking about the one with Jet Li talking about the one with Christopher Lambert and um, Sean Connery. But my brain is a stodgy mess, apparently. So I can't remember what it's called. Highlander! Thanks, Ralph. This is like Egyptian god Highlander. Yeah, this is uh, just uh, not really any new rules here. Just new gods and new powers. All the Ankh tokens there. We got all of the gods' powers. So let's have a look. And then these cards here are there. Um, merger cards. We got their battle cards here. We know all the gods have the same battle decks. Uh, the devotion arcs there and the bases that you need for your guardians. Alright. So we've just got the warriors and the gods in this set. Oh, we saw the priests in the pantheon set for this expansion. Wah, let's have a look and see what these abilities are all about. I'm all about them abilities. 
All right, Thoth, god of knowledge, and illegible here because of my camera being terrible at focusing. All right, Thoth, god of knowledge, monkey god, wisdom of Maat. In each of your battles, after all players selected cards, but before they are revealed, you may place one follower from the supply on the scale below to guess the card played by one opponent. If the guess is, if you guess incorrectly, give all followers on the scale to that opponent. At the end of each conflict event, before any other effect, discard all followers on the scale. You gain one devotion for each follower discarded. Oh wow. If you guess incorrectly, give all followers on the scale to the opponent. That's really interesting. What a fun little game. Oh god, I bet that could be really excruciating. You could get a bunch of devotion that way though, that'd be cool. Alright, Horus, god of the sky. It's a big bird guy. The Eye of Horus. At the start of each conflict event, you may choose up to two battle regions to place one eye token, the Eye of Horus. At the start of a battle where the there's an eye, return the token here and name a card other than Circle of Mott. The player, including you, no player, including you, can play that card during this battle. You can ban certain battle cards if you wish with Horus. Hathor, Goddess of Love. So she's got many arms with which to love you. And she has selfless devotion. After resolving any effect that makes you sacrifice followers, you may sacrifice an additional follower. If you do summon a figure, it may be a guardian you've just gained adjacent to any of your figures or monuments. That's great. Yep. Get an additional action. Love that. Love the goddess of love. Basset. Bastet, the lioness goddess. Goddess of cats. She's got a really long ability. Cats of Bubastis. Cats of Bubastis. I love it. I love saying Bubastis. After setup and after each conflict event, gather and place all of your cat tokens on the board, face down, each on a monument in a different region. Okay, so we're going to have cat tokens. When you reveal your card in a battle where there's a cat token, reveal the cat as well and add its listed strength to yours. Star adds zero. Once per turn, before or after an action, an opponent may reveal a cat adjacent to one of their figures Returning it to Bastet. If it is a star, kill that figure and you gather and place all your cat tokens on the board face down, each on a monument in a different region. Wow, where are these cat tokens? That seems crazy interesting. Like, it's a whole little bluffing game you're playing with cat tokens. Oh, they're there. There's three of them. So there's three cat tokens. Um, and they just look like that. And then there's a, a plus three, a plus one, and a star. And I guess the yellow ones there are the Eye of Horus. Oh, that's fun. So you just got these little cats that basically run around and wreak havoc. <laughs> All right, Set, God of Chaos. That sounds cool. So it's got a big old snake hanging out. The Betrayer. Yeah, okay, so he is the one that betrayed Horus. Uh, Osiris. I, that might be wrong, but it seems likely. During conflict events, opponents, warriors, and guardians adjacent to your god count as yours instead of theirs. 
What? That's awesome. You just take over enemy figures by standing next to them. Very cool. Very, very cool. Alright, let's take a look at these figures then. Is there more tape on this tray? Did I cut it? I did not cut the tape yet. Tape be gone! Wah! That was a mess. But hey, we got it open. And that's the important thing. Wow, Set really does just have a massive snake. And a big old spear. And a hat to rival Ammon's. Where is Set's Warriors? Get back into your various spots. I have no idea if these are the right spots for you. These are Ammon. Ammon's uh, Set's Warriors also look pretty cool, actually. They look like they're going pretty crazy with these two huge swords. I guess they're not... These are the most loyal followers in the game. Because all other followers in a game with set can be traitors. Or warriors. I should say warriors because followers is actually a token in the game. Yep, yeah, cool. I wonder if these swords really existed and what they were called. They look pretty gruesome though. Hmm. Okay, so where? Who's next? Uh, this guy. Oh yeah, his priests had these. Uh, he's got the um little thing there. I said it looked like a scale, but it's it's some kind of pouch. So this is our um, mysterious monkey god. What's his name? I forgot it. It was uh, Thoth, god of knowledge. What is that he's holding? Is it a no? It's a giant sword. He's got a giant sword, and he's very angry. And he also has these little urns and some scrolls of wisdom on his belt, because he's the god of knowledge and has the wisdom of Maat. Maat. Cool. Um, we've got Hather, the goddess of love. She's got four arms and four things, but no Ankh. So I guess she's probably not going to win the game, Ankh. But she does have frilly leggings. And she kind of looks like she's about to burst into dance, which I can kind of get behind. There's a lot going on around her sort of um, head area it's on the mini. Um, 
Come on, focus so we can see the detail. She's quite like she's quite a finely detailed mini. Almost perfect camera. Damn it, there we go. Like there's a lot of detail going on around there. Sort of decorative things. I guess she's another bull mini as well, so she can get together with Pata, the creator builder guy. And then together they can just create things, and that's nice. I like this headcanon. Maybe they can merge and then win the game by creating stuff. I'm on board with this headcanon I've created. And then uh, there's Horus, who's clearly the biggest and most impressive miniature in this set. He's pretty, pretty amazing. I have to focus this camera a little bit because he's actually too big. Get right up close to it. Come on. Pretty cool, though. Like, if this figure was coming at me, I would be surprised to learn it only has one strength. It's very detailed. I mean, I don't know how if you guys can make out his chest armor here, but there's a lot of detail on that and around the figure's neck here as well. Um, and on the headdress, but especially all around the chest area there, there's just an enormous amount of detail. Oh, the spears have eyes on. That's quite cool. Because he's got two eyes of Horus. You get two eyes on the spears. That's pretty neat. Cool. Uh-oh. That's the too hot alarm. You're too hot. <laughs> Please cool down. Um, I think that's it for, uh, for Pharaoh's set. Oh, we have this. Whatever this is. The Tiny Surprise Pharaoh Pantheon. Sorry, the, this is the Pantheon set. What is the tiny... Oh! It's Bastet's Cats! And uh, some Plastic Eyes of Horus as well. That's cool. Oh, and tiny stickers to put on Bastet's Cats' faces. Great. I love that. Oh, we didn't look at Bastet. We almost missed her. Good God. That's not it for Pantheon at all. So she's got like a whole lion and a panther, or no, a female lion. Um, so she got a couple of lions there. And also tiny kitties to go with them. Awesome. I would 100% play as Bastet and then just fill up the guardians with cat warriors and just have an Egyptian cat off. This can be done. It is possible. We have the means. Did we not look at their warriors? I don't think we actually looked at all the warriors either. I think I'm getting... I think I've got too much sun going to my head. We haven't looked at any of the warrior figures. We looked at some gods. And then the warriors. And then that... we, And then the warriors for Set. And that was it. Here are the warriors for the goddess of love. A uh, Haster. Hather. So they're playing flutes, I think. They're here to make friends with you. They don't want to fight. Hang on. I have to turn this, uh... I have to turn this, uh... 
alarm off. Let's be a second. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, Eddie's pointing out that it is 12.30 here. Sorry, uh, Heggers is pointing out it's 12.30 here and there's no sun, uh, which is correct. Uh, what I really meant was just the heat, the heat from the lights, and also it's still very hot outside, even though it's late at night. I was kind of hoping to avoid the heat by filming late at night, but it didn't really work out that way. It's still very hot. So here is the pan, the, the goddess of love's flautist warriors. And then, of course, Horus's spear-wielding warriors, um, who are very bright here under the, the light. But they look like proper warriors. Oh, look at that! Some kind of... I guess that's his wing. They're uh, homaging their god's wing. But yeah. Cool headdress. Cool shield. Nice. Uh, we've got um, Thoth. Thoth's warriors here. Yeah, Hagers, it's super hot. Um, I don't. Are you you're not in London. You're in the UK somewhere, aren't you? But yeah, it's it's very hot. And our, our the thing is, it's. I'm sure there's people out there who live in much hotter climes than us who are, um, laughing at the the relatively low heat here. But it's also that none of the architecture in this country is really built for this. Um. So there's no air con or basements or anything like that. And when I was redoing the studio over the last two days, yeah, you're in the Midlands. When I was redoing the studio over the last few days, I was up in the attic a lot and it was just a furnace up there. Apparently it's as hot here as it is in Barbados. So that's probably a, a, an omen. But yeah, I like um, I like Thoth's warriors here. They look uh, they look very cool. I like this ponytail, long ponytail. Cool. One last warrior. It's. Bastet's warriors. So, of course, they have a lion face on their shield. All the models so far have been really good. Um, Kujo Painting was pointing out that uh, it's a bit of a shame that they've all been the, um, the same sculpt. And yeah, that is a shame, actually, that they don't have multiple sculpts. But... Um, there are an awful lot of them, and they all look pretty good. Yeah, the white plastic, it is harder to make out the details on. I mean, I reckon that uh, Thoth himself looks okay. The big god mini looks okay. But uh, certainly on the little uh, the little minis, um, it is, some of the detail is lost. I mean, also on these cameras. Um... But even in, in real life, it's a bit tricky to uh, make out the detail exactly. Um, and they are quite delicate, these figures as well. I mentioned it. They certainly seem deli more delicate on the, um, the priestesses uh, as well in the, uh, the pharaoh set. 
And then we got the, the little tokens here as well. Okay, cool. Um, I think then that's the Pantheon set. Done. I don't think there's anything else to look at in here. Which means I think we've pretty much seen most of it. We will now take a look at the, uh... We will take a look at the, um... Uh-oh, set. Stop being a bad boy. God of Chaos. Stopping the box from closing. But, uh, we will take a look at the, um... Of course, we'll take a look at the... The final box, even though I think that it's not really got a whole lot in it. That is, um going to be especially interesting. It's going to be uh, fancier player boards and fancier uh, Ankh tokens, and that's it. But we might as well take a look while we're here and round off the, uh, the unboxing. I'm getting very, very hot and very sweaty, so... This is probably a good time to uh, to do that, but oh, this is really heavy. It's got to be full of that card. I don't know if this is available at retail, the Divine Offering box. Ralph says he skipped all of the expansions because he's out of shelf space. I feel you, Ralph. I completely relate to this. And I have to play Ankh now, so I can determine if it's good enough to stick around. And continue to occupy shelf space. Dun 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 dun. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of Ankh uh, tokens for all the different gods. So you can replace all of those punch boards with the little plastic ones if this is something that is appealing to you. I guess we've got literally every god as well from all of the um, all of the sets. I think uh, we've even got The Sobek and Ta in here as well, the the gods from the Box of Wonders. And then underneath here we've got yeah, cardboard versions of all of the merging boards. And we've got even Ta and Sobek, the ones from the Box of Wonders. So there you go. And yeah, then we've got all of the, uh, the god boards. Are they all double-sided like this? Oh my god, have I missed this? Are all the were all the god boards double-sided in all of the other sets? Hang on. They are. Oh, that's cool. I had no idea. So all of the god boards are double-sided with uh, information about the gods on them. Uh, there is a quote, a cool quote, and then also some information about the gods. It's probably a good thing we didn't read all of this, or I would be... It would be a, probably another half an hour and I'd be dead. <laughs> I'd look like a preserved pharaoh. But it's cool that they've got that there, and they're slightly um, redesigned on the back of the Divine Offerings box because, of course, it's got punch. You can punch out the uh, the spaces here and put in your, your Ankh tokens there, so when you go ahead and buy those Ankh powers, you can reveal that and put them up there. And you've still got the the quote here and the information about the god down here. <laughs> yeah, Hangers, we're not going to go back and read all of these. <laughs> oh. 
But yeah, look at that. I've got one for every single god. Going all the way back to, so back at the back there. A crocodile god. Cool. Oof. And that, I think, is it. I don't think we need to uh, spend too much more time looking at the Divine Offerings box. I suppose now I must figure out some way to combine all of these boxes in some way so that they're all in one place. Cool, though. That's cool. Well, I personally am very excited to play Ankh. Um, and I hope that you folks who have it arriving with you at home are also very excited to play. Look at my t-shirts actually sticking to me. I'm so sweaty. <laughs> this is too hot for these lights, man. Um, but thanks. I hope this has uh, helped you to um, figure out if... Uh, not figure out, but to get some insight into what's coming to you if you've got Ankh coming. Or uh, if you're excited to play with your friends who do have Ankh coming. <laughs> Ralph says that uh, if you did miss anything, he's very close to the Simon headquarters in Singapore. So he can go and pick up something over there if he needs to do it. But um, yeah, personally, I'm very excited about, uh, about Ankh and playing Ankh. And trying to figure out what my favorite one of the triptych is. The question is, if you have a favorite... Or if there's like uh, there's one like that you're not getting to the table, or maybe you don't feel they're all distinct enough, are you gonna get rid of them? Or is the completionist and you gonna make you keep the Eric Lang trilogy? I don't know. I'm gonna have to play them a bit and find out. I mean, I definitely got Blood Rage to the table more than Rising Sun, but Rising Sun has been out longer. I mean, not as long. It's also more involved, I think. I think Blood Rage is easier to pick up and play. Although apparently, Ankh is the shortest and most sort of streamlined of the three. Apparently. So. Eddie said he got rid of Rising Sun because he prefers Blood Rage. And that's fair. Rising Sun, I think, if, um, if Ankh is indeed shorter than Blood Rage then it will be the shortest of the three, but Rising Sun is the longest by a margin. I mean, for me, Blood Rage is a game you can play on like a game night, but Rising Sun is like, it's like a convention game. It's more of like a, a sort of a day event, really. Pekka says the opposite for her. Once you uh, learn the specific Blood Rage cards, it gets boring. But Eddie says that the theme of Blood Rage was more appealing to his group. There is, uh, I think there is definitely an element of learning the cards in Blood Rage. Um, but of course, if you've got all of the fancy Kickstarter stuff, you've got more replayability in there. But uh, if you don't, then, then you don't. But yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, Blood Rage is so good. I can't imagine getting rid of it personally. But I've also kept Rising Sun because I, I really like Rising Sun. And I like the uh, the politics around the uh, the, uh, the first phase there um, in, in that game. So, But I do like the idea of Ankh being sort of short and dirty. So I say shorter than the, the other two. I mean... Oh god, it is late and hot. But uh, yeah, it is definitely... Um, it is definitely... A, a genre where the short, short sort of games in the, in the genre appeal to me. Eddie says, uh, Ankh might go over well with his group because they're all Stargate fans. Yes. Oh, Pekka, no worries. Sorry about that for misgendering you. <laughs> um... I just, uh, I think it's, um, it's the vowel on the end of the name sounds, or on the end of Pekka sounds a bit effeminate, so I, of course, assumed your gender, which was wrong with me, and I should have asked for clarification, I apologize. Um, 
Pekka, yeah, it sounds like it's short for Rebecca or something. It does. Um, my bad. Uh, Eddie says, the main reason for getting rid of Blood uh, Rising Sun was that his group wasn't into it, which is, of course, the reason we get rid of anything, really. Um, if we can't get it to the table, then, you know... Uh, that's why I started, uh, you know, a YouTube channel. Because uh, I, I have now got an excuse to get anything to the table. If I, if I can't get it to the table in my game group, I'll just live stream it on YouTube. You know, if it has a solo mode, of course. And if it doesn't, I'll just uh, keep it anyway, because clearly I'm terrible. <laughs> As you can all see now. There is another two rows, and then an entire stack. Yeah, hence the collection behind me, Eddie. Pekka says, do you sell your games or do you have infinite shelving? Um, no, I actually do sell games or give them away um, or get rid of them otherwise. Uh, I have a sort of a weird internal series of rules about um, whether or not there were, for example, a review copy or something I purchased with my own money. Um, there's definitely a certain number of games that exist in the collection as well, because I'm just an optimist. Um, and I have, a, I have quite a lot of games as well that are, that are event games, you know, once a year or something like that. But, um, you know, I also have, a number of groups that I play with that are all very different so it's nice to have a whole big selection um, the Lord of the Rings games is this is journeys in Middle-earth yeah that's uh, that's our journeys in Middle-earth set now the question is after my experiences with journeys in Middle-earth Am I going to buy Spreading War, the new expansion that's coming out? The, are they finally going to fix my issues with it? Or I have called, actually, I was very, after finishing um, the Shattered Paths streams, I was very close to selling um, Journeys of Middle Earth and just sort of giving up on it. But I think I would like to have another go at that final mission of Shattered Paths before I do, because. Um, because I can, because they've added that functionality in. But I feel like uh, I feel like it's I, th I feel like all of my issues with Journeys in Middle Earth are with the app, which is why I sort of hold out hope that they might fix them. But what I really want is for them to just add the ability for people to make custom campaigns. That'd be great. Um, Dark says I only played War of the Ring uh, before. Uh, I've got War of the Ring here somewhere. Where is it? I've actually, I think I've got um, both the first and second edition of War of the Ring. But this first edition might be in the attic because I was meaning to sell it. I think it's in the attic in the sale pile. Yes, there is an attic with more games. <laughs> I don't think we can see War of the Ring from down. Can we see War of the Ring? Where is it? I, I've not actually arranged these with filming in mind, so... Nope, you can't. It's actually under Stars or Star Wars Rebellion. Directly above my head, there is a... Um, a You see Codex? These are the head-to-head the -head games, right? Like the two-player head-to-head games. So Codex has War of the Ring on top of it, which has Star Wars Rebellion on top of that, which has Flick Fleet on top of that, which is a cool dexterity game about flicking pieces at one another so there you go have you made any collection videos I'm not sure if I've seen no well I said this I think on the patreon post I made about reorganizing the set which is that the reason I never had my collection in the background of any of the videos was that it always seemed very ostentatious and I didn't really want to do that uh, it was not a look I liked particularly, but um, when I reorganized the studio recently, 
I, there just isn't a better backdrop that's also reasonably convenient. Like, I literally thought about putting up a green screen and just green screening different backgrounds into every video, but that's so much work. So, this just felt like, you know, a reasonably good backdrop for a board game video series, you know? <laughs> no way have you played all these board games. That's insane. What's your all-time favorite? I have played all these board games. Um, more or less. There is, I think... Um, yeah, the expansion for Sons of Anarchy here is still in shrink. I can't get it out now. That, so I haven't played that one. Um, obviously, it's still in shrink. But um, pretty much everything else. Uh, what's my favorite? I'm a big sucker for Mage Knight. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of Too Many Bones, or I wouldn't have the Trove Chest. Um, I, I just like adventure games. But I also, I mean... I, I, I'm not good at picking. I mean, I love Suburbia. That's why I have the big collector's edition. I had the original printing of that when it came out in 2012. But I sold those on. Um, but I recommend the new printing. The second edition printing is really nice. And it's got all the art from the collector's edition, which is really nice. I don't think there's a whole lot in the collector's edition you'd be missing out on if you got that and the expansion set box. Uh... Pekka says, I'm a... <laughs> yeah, with my green screen work, everything would just be disappearing if I had a green screen backdrop. Yep, that's true. Um, yeah, a collection video would be fun. I mean, there is some pretty rare out-of-print games in this collection. Um, so, that would probably be fun to do, but... I I don't know, I just always felt like, uh, it always just felt, yeah, it always just kind of felt ostentatious to me. Um, I like to, I like to show off games that you can buy, that you can acquire relatively easily, typically. That's why I don't do a lot of the unboxing videos when I get these big Kickstarters in either. Um, I like to show you the stuff that you can reasonably acquire and play and that are fun. But do you have Monopoly? I have two Monopoly sets, actually, in this collection. Um, they are in the uh, section that is for old games. I've got, um, and both of them are the old Monopolies where the box, the board doesn't actually go in the box. It's a little box that comes with the board. One is a British printing of Monopoly from 1940 something. It was actually printed during the war and it doesn't have dice in it because the factories that produce dice were being repurposed for the war, so it's got a, a spinner to determine the role. Uh, so that's fun. And the other's a Danish Monopoly set that I got from my grandfather, which I particularly like because it doesn't have the electric plant or the um, power plant. It's got the Tuborg and um, and um, the other famous Danish beer. It's on the tip of my tongue. Um, it's the two Borg Brewery. It's the two breweries. Um, so that's really that's really fun. It's all in Danish, so we have to use Google Translate on the cards to figure out what they're saying. Because um, I don't speak Danish, even though I actually have Danish nationality. Um, I know some words, <laughs> but it's a really hard language. Um, have you played Forgotten Waters? That's, is that the pirate adventure game, um, Bruce? I heard it was really good, but I haven't played it. Eddie says, my oldest out-of-print game is Combots. I don't know what Combots is. I also have, uh, somewhere a copy of the, um, in that classic game section, I've got a copy of Go, uh, which I wish I was better at, but I like Go. Go is fun. Um... And I've also got the Royal Game of Ur from the uh, the British Museum. They do a, a replica of the Royal Game of Ur, which comes with the, uh, the, the basic game and also the advanced game, which they've tried to piece together the rules from for, or piece together the rules for from the old uh, stuff. That's, that's cool. 
Maybe I should do a collection showing at some point. I would show you guys, but it's way up there and I can't possibly reach it. It's hiding behind all the all the old uh, kids games. When I say kids games, I mean my three copies of Hero Quest and also Dark uh, Dark World, which is terrible but also fun. That's the Royal Game of Ur, right on top in black. And that's a nice backgammon set. So these are the classic, your classic board games section right here, sitting on top of Batman, Batman Gotham City Chronicles because it's terrible. <laughs> Combots is an old FASA game from the early 80s, which they did prior to doing Battletech. Bruce says, yes, Forgotten Waters is Pirates, and I think you'd like it. Yeah, I think I would like Forgotten Waters, uh, Bruce. I've heard it's good. It's kind of a fun narrative-driven game, which I like that stuff, so I probably would like it. Um, are those the food chain magnates behind you? Yes, they are. Food Chain Magnate and the Ketchup Mechanic expansion. I love Food Chain Magnate. I do actually like Splatter, uh, as you can see. I've also got Antiquity over there. And I've got um, the Roads and Boats 25th Anniversary Edition box up at the top. And I've also got um, the Great Zimbabwe and Indonesia somewhere as well. Darkblaze says, I actually work at a toy shop and sometimes I'm baffled by the board games being made. Jaws, for example, seems so weird as a board game. I heard that the Jaws game was good. That's uh, the... Um, oh, what are they called? The... Um, that quite clever group of designers out of uh, North America who call themselves uh, the one thing. They're a collective of designers and they do all the... the um, they do all of the, uh, all of the, um, movie tie-ins. Yeah, I mean, I heard it was very light. Jaws is very light. And it's like two phases. Like the first phase is preparing to hunt the shark. And the second phase is hunting the shark. And it's a one versus many where everyone else is the crew on the boat and one person's the shark. But it's quite, apparently it's quite short and quite light, but it's fun. Some people were complaining about uh, component quality. Oh god, what are they called? I don't know if I actually have a single one of their games. Because they are American based, and so a lot of their games come out here later. They did the Pan Am game as well, didn't they? And also the... Um, the Tom... the What's the Tom Cruise movie? About the airplanes. And think about the designers specifically. Ravensburger is a German company, yeah. Um, did they publish Jaws? That's not who I'm thinking of, though, Eddie. Um, I'm thinking of designers, which I would look up, but I don't have a keyboard currently. And Villainous? Oh, I played Villainous. That was dreadful. Did they design that too? Yeah, we played Villainous and we were, we were very unimpressed with it. Pego says he's got a lot of Awaken Realms and Osprey games. Prospero! Prospero Hall! Thank you, Dark Blaze. That's who I'm thinking of. I hope I've credited them correctly with all of the games I just mentioned that they I hope they actually designed the ones I was talking about there. Yeah, I don't think I have a single Prospero Hall game actually, but I have played a few of them, I guess. Um and they did the Top Gun, the Top Gun game as well. And they've just brought out um the Goonies game, which I've heard is okay. Um but uh, I was never really a big Goonies fan cuz I just didn't see that movie when I was a kid, so I just didn't really had that same connection with it that a lot of people had or in the 80s. Um, 
But I tell you what, talking of talking about Osprey games, I do have Imperium Legends and Imperium the other one over there on my desk. Uh, classic. Imperium Classic. I played Imperium Classic already, actually. I played with a friend of mine. We played Rome versus... He was Rome and I was... Greece. I must have been Greece because I had Alexander. Um, and I won. And it was like two hours long. And I quite liked it, so I bought them. But it's, uh, it's I like deck building. I'm a sucker for deck builders. What you can't see is over there are all of the dominions in like three of the calyxes. Um uh, but uh, yeah, I liked uh, Imperium. I mean it's definitely long. It's like a it's like a sort of a chill afternoon game, I think. I don't know. I've heard it's I've heard it scales up fine with three and four, but I don't know. The impression I got from playing it with two is that I wouldn't want to play it with more than two people really. Because the player interaction was fairly low. Um, and I don't know what the benefits of playing it with more people would be, but I liked it well enough to get it. Then also I wanted to play it solo on the channel maybe, and it was flying off the shelves. Like I checked it and they there were, it was like in stock everywhere for about 22 quid a box online. And then when I went back and looked, it was 25. And now I think they're selling at retail. But they're sold out, so I don't know what happened between, like, me playing it and, like, a week later, but um, I think a lot of them are sold out. Uh, Eddie says, the Goonies game was fun, but I think Horrified is their best. Of course, I'm biased as I'm a huge Universal Monsters fan. Yeah, I've heard Horrified um, was actually pretty good, and also I saw you could get it fairly cheap in the States and, like, the Targets and stuff. Because that's Prosper's whole, whole, whole thing, isn't it? They make, like, games that target will stock um so you can get them at a fairly and i think that's kind of an admirable uh goal really like i know some of their games are not as good as the others but overall i've heard good things about their games i heard pan am was really good um so if they're making games that are in stock reasonably priced and of decent quality you know i think that that's great like in many ways you know it's it's easy to get wrapped up in uh in these huge kickstarters and just forget about uh you know actually the value of a game that's just really accessible and affordable uh dark says i've been thinking of getting a civilization board game because i'm a huge fan of the video games have you or anyone in chat played it before you mean uh civilization like specifically um based on on the Sid Meier civilization games or do you just mean a civilization themed game um, and I wonder if they included nuclear Gandhi in the board game well because I mean the the latest civilization like sort of Sid Meier tie-in civilization game was civilization uh, New Dawn which I did on the channel Michael and I weren't super impressed with it and they actually sold it but they came out with the Terra Incognita expansion, which is supposed to make it actually a lot better. And uh, so I think that the pair of them are supposed to be very good. The, the, the New Dawn with the expansion. I didn't think it was all that great. But I mean, don't get me started on civilization games. That is, game, board games with a civilization theme. Because they're kind of... Um, there's many, many different kinds of them. It's a hard theme to capture and a lot of it depends on whether you find anachrony to be a problem in your game uh, like a thematically sort of breaking thing um, and that is to say you know you're you're building you know tanks but you haven't discovered writing yet you know is anachrony a problem for you in terms of breaking the theme because I know that can be a huge deal breaker for some people who are a fan of that theme it's never been a problem for me I find it amusing i actually find it really humorous when your civilization is all out of whack but um but uh in terms of like sort of i mean many people accuse sid meyer of uh of taking civilization off of the original um 
Civilization board game. So there was a board game called Civilization, which I believe, wasn't that Glenn Drover? Weren't we playing one of his? There were two designers on that. One of them was Glenn Drover, and the other was the guy who did the Mega Civ board game, um, I think. And he recently kickstarted Mosaic, which is a Civilization game, which we didn't think much of. We played it on the channel. Um, no, we didn't play it on the channel. We did it in a Kickstarter commentary. But Chris and I played it with a few of our friends. Um, but, uh, I mean, for me, my one of my favorite Civilization games is still Through the Ages. Like, I love Through the Ages. Um, it's also got the anachrony problem, you know. Um, but it's a sort of a competitive... Co it's like two or three hours long. And it has got like strict player elimination it's rare it's got also logical player elimination so you can be like two hours in and um actually does it have strict no i think it's mostly logical player elimination like you can be two hours in and basically be out of the game but i really like it i think it's great um i'm a big fan of it as a civilization game um this is the second edition, the new story of civilization. Um, but uh, also, um, Glenn Drover's... Uh, the game he made based on... So he made... Glenn Drover made... He was um, the designer behind Mosaic, but he did a game based on Age of Empires 3, which was Age of Empires 3, Age of Discovery which is the actual video game title. And yeah, get the app for Through the Ages on your iPad. And if you like it, or get it on your phone, it's a good app. And if you like it, it might be worth getting the game. Because, and the reason I say that is actually because I think the app is quite expensive. And I wouldn't, I'd always hesitate to recommend an expensive app over the board game, but Through the Ages is complex. It's hard, it's a big teach. Um, it's, it's a whole commitment, like, it's a commitment to learn it, especially seeing as, um, especially seeing as the, um, the game has this, like, sort of logical elimination, so you can get, like, two hours in and pretty much know, or, like, even, like, an hour and a half in, you're halfway through, it's three ages, you're halfway through the second age, and you're like, I'm probably not gonna win this. Uh, I have seen comebacks in it, it is definitely possible to, to come back around in the game for sure. Uh, this is sort of a river of cards that you're drafting from and these cards progress as you go through the ages becoming increasingly powerful and so it is possible to come back um, but uh, yeah it's a complex game and also knowing the cards you have a bit of an advantage so it might be worth getting the app and playing with a few friends but the thing is like if you're going to play with a few of you by the time three of you have bought the app, you could have probably bought the game. I think you can get it for about 35 quid online. It's not like an expensive game. Um, but uh, yeah, Glenn Drover made a game that was based on his Age of Empires 3 game called Age of Discovery. In Age of Discovery, there was a deluxe edition of that, which was really nice. And um, the point is it's really good. And also... I think it's coming back to Kickstarter via Eagle Griffin Games for a reprint early next year. So that's one to keep your eyes on. If the theme of the colonial era is something that you're okay with playing with, which I understand is very off-putting for a lot of people for obvious reasons. Um, but it is a good game. Uh, do you have Zia Legends of a Drift System and have you played it? I played it one time with um, my fr a friend of mine who has a copy, although he sold it now, so I probably won't get to play it again. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was, uh, not great. I heard that, um, I mean, I like the theme. I like the idea of sandbox space game. That's very appealing to me. Um, I, I like, I like the, the ship stuff where you're working on your ship. And I like that you can do the trade route, so you can go and do the military thing and fight the pirates. But um, we found we found the the core game to be quite 
uh, like the the market and the economy stuff was not well balanced apparently they fixed some of that with the expansion but I don't know maybe um, maybe maybe we didn't give it uh, a fair shake we only played it once but um, I think I like the idea of zeal a lot more than I like the actual game but I do have, uh, I don't know, I, I, I've, I find there aren't a lot of sandbox games that I really, really like. I like the idea of sandbox games, but I find, in my experience, they, 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 it's hard to keep them exciting. Pekka says you need the expansion for it to shine. Yeah, I heard that. Um, it was better with the expansion. Speaking of deck builders, I've recently fallen into playing the digital version of Star Realms. I forgot how much I enjoy it. I actually like the Star Realms app a lot more than I like the game in real life. Um, and that's because I find in real life the market offering in Star Realms, particularly if you've got a lot of the expansions worked in, uh, can be just be so violently random uh, and sort of frustrating. Um... You know, there's a river of a marketplace, which is, you know, funny because it's actually not in if you look at it just as a fundamental mechanism, it's not that different to the river in Through the Ages, but Through the Ages uh, works really well. And I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a lot more complexity in Through the Ages. There's a lot more going on. So it's actually very different once you build everything else out. Um, whereas Star Realms is, is you know, it's a deck builder and it's not, yeah, through the ages, it's a, a tableau builder. So very different things. Um, but um, Star Realms, you know, that fundamentally, that, that chance of a random card coming out. Um, I find when I'm playing the app solo, it doesn't bother me at all. But when I'm playing it in real life, uh, it can be very frustrating. And also it frustrates uh, other people I've played with as well. Digital version of Hero Realms? Yeah. I mean, I haven't played Hero Realms. I've only played Star Realms. Um, but, uh, I mean, I like, uh, I like Deck Builders, so I might like Hero Realms. I don't know. I don't know if I'll get it. When did this become the, the, the chit chat stream? It's nice hanging out and chatting with you guys, though. Thanks for hanging out and talking. Um, but I have run out of water, almost. So I probably need to go and hydrate. So I'll probably... I should probably do um, a, a collection tour, um, Pekka. So if that's something that people want, I will do that. And just talk about games. I mean, I could just sit here and talk about games until the cows come home. Um, Ralph says, I'm looking forward to your Alter Quest stream. Yes, Ralph, that is happening. Um, I don't think it's going to happen before the UKG now, which was my goal. I wanted to get it done before UKG because it was one of the, the three games that won the Patreon vote uh, for this month. Um, the other two being Etherfields and Village Attacks. But um, I just haven't had a, the chance to sort of get my head around the rules well enough to stream it. And so obviously UKG is the turnover of the month. So, But yes, it will definitely be happening. And it will be happening, if not now, then maybe the weekend after I come back from UKG. Um, but we'll be doing, I think, uh, I'll be doing Soul Raiders Part 2 tomorrow. And then I'm going to try and do Etherfields this weekend. Etherfields next. I just need to remember how to play it. Um, Etherfields is tough though. Etherfields is really hard because the setup time is a lot. So it takes a long time to set up. Um, I also ordered the correct playmat the right way around, which I haven't received yet. I don't know when they were shipping those out. I guess it'll come with Wave 2. I probably didn't pay for extra shipping, so... Ralph says, I've painted most of it, but I've not brought it to the table yet. It's... Yeah, it's... It's, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, do you know, it's actually funny. I was thinking about Soul Raiders the other day. I was thinking about the first playthrough of Soul Raiders. And I was thinking about a bit about how 
in many ways, Soul Raiders kind of seems like some of the best parts of Aetherfields. Like, it actually struck me how sort of similar they were because, you know, it's just like way less complicated. Um, of course, the theme is completely different, but mechanically, they're both hand management games, essentially, um, with deck building. You know, in, in Soul Raiders, the deck building is very minor because you're just leveling up and uh, you're adding some level up cards and some items to your deck. So it's a very small part of it. But you're still, you've got these cards that are multi-purpose that can be used, that are used to overcome challenges. And the challenges are combat and sort of skill checks that are printed on cards that your miniature's adventuring around on. Like with the with the 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 main the main difference is the combat but it feels like you know a lot of soul raiders feels like the dream sequences from ether fields and then just without the overworld stuff without the slumber deck um and without all the the sort of unlocking of the cards but i presume that's because i have a tiny prototype but uh <laughs> if I put my Xbox in a cardboard box, is it also considered a board game? If I play Carcassonne on my Xbox, am I still playing a board game? Um, these are the kinds of questions that plague us and keep us from worrying about the real things. <laughs> the, the real heavy things. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to give up on Aetherfields yet, but it's just, it's just a huge undertaking even to stream, like... I know that Aetherfields won't be less than four hours when I stream it. Like, there's no short session of Aetherfields. Uh, which is why I doesn't see the streaming as often um, as I would like it to, because I would like to get to the end of it. But I don't even think I'm halfway through yet. So, I don't know. We'll see how long it takes. We'll see, we'll see if, uh, if I stick with it or if I get to the point where I'm like, I gotta start doing the, the dream-only variant or something like that because i'm currently playing the full game you know but there's all these variants to make it faster i don't know if i want to i've i think i'd feel a bit like i'd sort of given up if i if i went to one of those variants but also because i'm saving between literally every dream i don't think i'm getting all of the fun out of the slumber deck i feel like i'm getting a lot less out of it I don't know, maybe I'll have to do like a week where I just set up Aetherfields and we just stream it constantly, but I think if I had a week off, there's just other stuff I'd rather do. I mean, a week of time putting in to put into the channel. Yeah, it's been very divisive, Aetherfields, uh, in terms of people's opinions. Um... I don't know if it's been more or less divisive than Tainted Grail. It certainly seems to me that uh, it's had more coverage in the media than Tainted Grail has. Possibly because Shut Up and Sit Down did it, and uh, I don't know, I don't think they did Tainted Grail. Um, did Rado do... I know Rado's just on Aetherfields. I don't know if he did Tainted Grail. Um, Ralph says, I am six or seven dreams into Aetherfields now. You and I are probably not far off around the same point then. I think I must be about six or seven dreams in. I'm not sure how many I've done, actually. But I feel like, you know, I'm still unlocking some of the rules. So I'm not, I can't be, you know, major... I think, I think I actually... I think I just got to the point in Aetherfields where I've kind of unlocked all of the main stuff. And now I'm, I'm sort of being shown how I'm going to progress towards some kind of conclusion so i mean it is exciting it's, yeah tainted grail um i haven't played any of it since uh, michael and i did it on the show and uh, oh yeah who was saying earlier someone said in chat um earlier that uh, i should do a live stream of food chain magnate but we did do a series on it and I thought it was really fun because we did a series where you had, because uh, obviously a huge part of Food Chain Magnet is building your company. Um, and uh, 
we had uh, we had like a one minute time limit to build our companies, which was really fun. Um, I think we played one of the rules wrong in that live stream act in that series actually. I think we played the one of the milestone the way you acquire milestones. I think we did that wrong. Um, which is uh, to whoever commented earlier, do you play? Have you played all these games? And how do you remember the rules for them all? That is one of the downsides of playing all of these games, is you often get, like... It can be tricky to remember all the little rules, you know? It's like, um... It's why when a game... And actually, I noticed this in Ankh. When they have a player aid that says, like, these are the ones that you're easily going to forget. Remember these. I always appreciate that when they put those in games, you know? Um, so it's nice to have, like, a sort of the, the important... Like, the little... It's the little rules where, you know, it's like... Do, when you re, you know the the little ones that are easy to confuse with other games, but that are hugely important. Um, so I always appreciate a reminder of those in a game, when you play a lot of different ones. Eddie says the bit I played of Change of Grounds have done immediately. Um, yeah, I like. Uh, I mean, the thing is like. It's kind of, you know, I have the same comment really about both Etherfields and Tainted Grail that I have around Journeys in Middle-Earth, which is that I, you know, I would have liked less content of a higher quality, I think, but I have a huge board game collection, so that's probably a part of why I feel that way. If uh, I know some people like to have an enormous amount of content to dive into, um, and really get like sort of and, and sink those hours in and go on that journey and it certainly is a different kind of journey you know when you um the length you know that that is a that is a, a type of experience you know And he says, the first time I played Rising Sun, I was beaten to a pulp by Eric Lang. I mean, that's fun. Um, the first time I played on Mars, uh, I played it with uh, Vital Lacerda. He taught it to Michael and I, and we both beat him. <laughs> and he actually taught it perfectly, and then for kept forgetting the rules. <laughs> he was... He was probably suffering from a pretty significant convention brain at the time, I think. But in my experience, actually, um, generally speaking, designers are often not very good at their own games. Which is kind of nice, I think. <laughs> Design the game that, uh, that flummoxes you. It's cool. But I think... Um, I think before I get started into uh, talking more about Awakened Realms and that kind of stuff, um, because I do really like Awakened Realms games, um, obviously. Uh, I've got them all, I think. Uh, actually, I don't have uh, this war of mine. That was Ben's copy we played on the channel. I never bought it, so I didn't feel like I needed to play it again after that. Um, but I got most of the others. Although I didn't back ISS Vanguard, but then they gave me a press copy, so I guess we'll be revisiting that. Um, and I am a bit bummed out they didn't send me a, a copy of the second prototype to look at, but I can understand, you know, that uh, I was not super enthusiastic about what we did experience, and, you know, they, they're very expensive, those prototypes, and they want to send them to the people that are going to be positive that I, you know, I am very grateful that they gave me a press copy of it, and I will definitely check it out when it arrives, and I really hope that it's good, because I really like it as a theme, and uh, I don't have a lot of good space adventure games at the moment, so that'd be very cool to have. Hey, This War of Mine is a, is a really... There are some games I do have in my collection, because I think they're interesting games, or important games and this war of mine is a game that i would like to have in my collection but you know we just can't have everything um, but it's a game i would like to have because i do think it's interesting and there are games i keep around because i think they're interesting um fog of love is a good example i think that's an interesting game 
and I think it can be a really sort of interesting thing to like sort of play around with um, even though it's it's I don't know if it's a good game necessarily um, I think it's a really interesting experience and it's a very unique experience um, Try to think of another one that I keep around in the collection. Because it's a pendulum. The real time worker placement game uh, is very interesting to me. So I keep that around. Yeah, it's right there. <laughs> it's literally on camera. I didn't think about what would be on camera in this shot. There's no more water. Uh, Pekka says, the only Kickstarter I missed that bothers me still is GKR Heavy Hitters. I don't even know why I enjoyed that a lot. Um, yeah, I haven't had a chance to play it. I saw it played once and it, I thought it looked interesting, but um, I wasn't particularly intrigued. I wasn't intrigued enough by it to seek it out. But it's a very pretty game. That was the one by, wasn't it the one by Weta Studios? The Lord of the Rings people? Didn't they make that game? Uh, Dark Blaze says, my friends aren't really into board games. Would it be better at that point to only get single player games? Or would most multiplayer games work on my own? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that I have maybe this optimistic belief that I think there's actually a game for everyone. And it's just a case of, and I think there's a game for every group as well. And it's just a case of finding that game, which is might explain why I have so many um, but you know I think when people say I'm not into board games they just haven't found the right board game you know um, if they don't like learning rules you know then you just got to find something really simple uh, which doesn't have a lot of rules you know if they don't like um, competitive games find something cooperative they don't like things that are um, super aggressive, you know, then find something that's like, uh, you know, not, you know, like a Euro game where it's not as, the player interaction isn't really as important. Um, you know, I think that there's there's games out there for everyone. It's just a case of finding the right one, but I think a lot of people get it into their minds that they're not going to like board games, that are not, they've had some bad experience with it, which is completely understandable and they're just put off by it you know um and that's the thing about games it's a, it requires the right mindset you know going in and the vast majority of them also require a huge upfront cost which is you know sitting down and learning the rules and making the effort but not all of them you know some games you can teach in 10 seconds and just, just get started they like monopoly in the game of life well, you can build on that, you know. Um, it's very easy, I think, to transition from something like Monopoly in the Game of Life into something that's hobby adjacent, you know. Um, and then move into uh, increasingly hobby games. When I say hobby games, I mean... I, was th I, I sort of use hobby as a term to describe games where being familiar with board game mechanisms makes learning the games easier you know so if you can sort of if you're the kind of person who's not really into hobby games at all um but you're still like you know something like chess is not really a hobby game because a lot of people are you know and that that's just a cultural thing you know a lot of people are familiar with the rules of that game even though they're not into board games similarly monopoly even though it has a lot of mechanisms in it that are familiar to hobby gamers it's not really a hobby game because it's just very common in people's households. Chronicles of Crime is a great game to get new people into. Yep, that's great. It's got the video game aspects. Um, I've got it down there. And it's under Awari. Oh, Awari is so good. Um, Awari is like passive aggressive, the board game. It's just territory control and a really complex scoring system. Um, but it's actually very light. Like it's, I say it's complex. It's, it's intricate. It's maybe, a, it's an abstract game, but, uh, I like it cause it's all the sort of the fun of like, uh, sort of territory control and butting heads. 
but without um, being particularly aggressive. Like, you know, you're constant, like every move, people are like, God damn it, why did you do that? So it's, 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 it's none of the politics of a war game, but with all the aggression of territory control. I like it. Um, I keep, I take a, Hangers, I've always got a couple of board games in my backpack, and I, you know, that I, and I'll, I'll pick, I'll even think about where I'm going and who I'm seeing, and I'll pick games that I think they might like, and more often than not, they never come out of the bag. I never even mention that I've got them. But very occasionally, someone will be like, oh, Mike, do you have any games? And I'll be like, yes. And that's the best feeling. Because, you know, it's always nice, it's always best to play games when people want, like, there's nothing worse than forcing people to play a game that they don't really want to learn, you know? Like, it's got to be the right time, you know? And eventually the right time will come around. The right time always comes up at some point. But it is always nice when you're solicited for a game. And it was unexpected. That's why I always have some with me. <laughs> Just in case. It happens. Eddie says, Zombieside Black Plague was the one I used as the gateway game for my group. Yeah, it's uh it's always good to it's always it's always uh good to start with a co-op, you know, um, because you know I think um, if you don't know what people are going to be into, what kind of stuff they might like, um, you know, I think like very political games, you know, like Inish or Titans or whatever, uh, very political games that can be very off-putting for people who are uh, who are not used to that kind of thing. So you know, cooperative games, circumvents all of that. Um, if you were stranded on an island and could have one board game well it'd have to be a solo game wouldn't it for my invader like I mean I think being stranded on an island with a bunch of people who really like political games and then taking something like um Rising Sun or Diplomacy, which was, of course, the inspiration for the political phase of Rising Sun, uh, would be a really interesting experience, but... Firm Invader says, you solo all your games almost. That You must have started watching the channel during the pandemic, because I basically never played solo games before the pandemic. Um... I've been uncovering the joys of solo games during the pandemic, but I was always, a, I'm, I've always been a very social board gamer. Like everything for me has always been, um, I've always been attracted to it socially. Um, and I always, you know, I always thought about like, um, setting up the live stream to, so that we could, um, live stream stuff because during the channel during the show chris and i would started to things like journeys to middle earth and we realized we would never be able to finish that in the edited curated content that i was making so if we wanted to finish something like a journeys in middle earth campaign we would have to live stream it um but i never actually got the live stream stuff up and running really effectively or properly until the pandemic and then I started doing it, you know, because I figured, like, everyone would be missing out on games nights, and we wouldn't really, you know, it just felt like a really nice sort of social way to interact and enjoy the medium and the media together. Um, diplomacy can wreck friendships, yeah. Um, but, you know, I think if it does wreck your friendship, you probably, you know... Um, it's, let's say, say it's testing. You know, I would like to think that, um, I would like to think that, um, my friendships would survive diplomacy. They're strong enough. Uh, uh, PCUMAC, uh, if you're just joining the stream now, I've just been talking about games for about half an hour or something, uh, where... 
done the Ankh unboxing, but fortunately it's all there if you want to go back and take a look at it. Um, or if you have any questions, uh, feel free to shoot them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them, having just gone through all the content of Ankh. With the exception of the playmat, which I don't know if I bought. <laughs> um, yeah, Heggers, and uh, I thank so much for your for your support as well. You know, um, I would have been streaming anyway, but it wouldn't have looked as good or been as uh, sort of effective as um, as it could have been without uh, the wonderful support of the patrons as well. So. Um, thank you so much for that, and you know, um, I'm looking forward to being able to to play something with the with you at the UKG. It's going to be fun, I think. It's going to be strange. It's been a while since I've done a proper game night or anything like that, but uh, you know, we'll figure something out. And um, I think we've got a few patrons who are going to be at UKG, so I'll have to put up some kind of poll or something where we figure out what on earth we're going to play. And yeah, Pekka, I mean, I, I've certainly streamed more solo board game content this year than I've played physical games. Uh, 100%, like, by, like, tenfold. You know? Um, and I've only just started getting some physical games in very recently. Um, and really just by pure accident. So, I'm very excited by the prospect of that sort of becoming more of a thing, but, you know, I'm very conscientious of the fact that uh, we have a terrible government here in the UK. Oh, sorry, I don't want to get political. But the point is, I'm still not 100% sure on how things are going here, so we just want to be careful, you know. We don't want anyone to be in any danger. That's the main thing. You know, we all want to get through this safely. And uh, hopefully we can make it a bit easier with uh... yeah, was, yeah. I mean, uh, getting uh, getting the physical game. I mean, it's always been important to me to get get the physical games out where we can, and not just resort to digital stuff. Um, and um, yeah, getting uh, getting Bloodborne to work, getting Jaws of the Lion to work with Chris. That's been um, that's been awesome. Um, it's a miracle, really, that we've got Chris's uh, f the, the cameras from Chris's feed coming in over the stream as well. That's uh, that's really fun that we're able to do that. I mean, the early stream seconds. If you go back and look at the live stream where Chris and I did Journeys in Middle Earth, um, I think that was that was way before the pandemic. Uh, that was just a kind of a disaster, really. Um, I think there's, uh, I mean, there's huge, there's, there's a lot of the early streams just have chunks where the audio is not working. Um, and now I've put so much work into OBS and making all the OBS scenes work together and function correctly that, um, I have like literal nightmares where my OBS is somehow uninstalled or lost or my computer stops working and I have to rebuild it all from scratch. It's like weeks and weeks of work. But uh, there's always room for improvement, you know, and getting um, getting the 4K table cam with the, the zoom in thing where we can move around on the table and see things closer up. That was a, a nice improvement. I think this will actually, I haven't streamed um, I haven't streamed ether fields with this camera, but I think it'll make a big difference. Um, I'm contemplating getting one for the for the green screen as well. I don't know if it will actually help the green screen to run better having a higher def camera down there. So I don't know if that's a good use of time. Uh, sorry, of money. Um, I'm also thinking of a better camera for the actual recorded stuff because obviously the webcams are not used for that. So I don't know if that would be something good, but uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get some some recorded and edited stuff. Oh, for my video, I'm so glad you brought up Legacy of Dragon Hall because that's still one of my favorite playthroughs that we did. And, like it's such a sleeper hit. I don't think anyone watched it. 
So, I, um, or very few people watched it. So I'm really glad that you watched that. Um, I do want to finish that with Ollie one day. I was this close to buying a copy of uh, Legacy of Dragon Hall for Ollie, so we could do it remotely, but um, but uh, it just didn't happen because I got so uh, just been so busy with all the other stuff I've been streaming. Um, and I think that I don't think Ollie liked like Super Dragon Alt nearly as much as I did. But uh, I'm gonna make him finish it with me. I want to know what happens. I still want to know how it ends. Very occasionally, um, you know, the patrons get to vote on all the on on the games that we're gonna play every month. But uh, there's still a few a few games that uh, I will choose and subject you to against your will, and nobody will watch except for you and I, and we'll enjoy it. I enjoyed that one, man. I don't think we were doing very well. I feel like a lot of people uh, who did watch that series, the very few people who did watch that series, I feel like their reaction was essentially just yelling. Yelling at me for making all the wrong choices. <laughs> but, you know, at least um, at least it's, it's low spoiler in the sense that unless you do horribly badly at it, you won't uh, have anything spoiled for you. But I think Legacy of Dragon Hall is actually great. I really like it. Um, I think it's a real shame that uh, Fantasy Flight didn't do anything more with that. Speaking of actual Fantasy Flight Cujo painting, if you're still here, um, I will go and try and check out the new version of Descent that's out at UKG. I'll go and have a look at that and see what I think of it. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with Descent, actually. That was one that I never really... There was one dungeon crawler I never really uh, played for various reasons. It just kind of came out at a time when I didn't have the right group for it and all of that. So I'm, I'm keen to see what they've done with this latest version of it. I know that it's fully cooperative and app-driven now, so that could be intriguing. But, uh, you know, it could also just be Journeys in the Lurk. Anyway, um, yeah, I think uh, I think we probably should wrap up the stream now because um, I was having so much fun chit-chatting. Now it's gone on way longer than I thought it would. And at some point, yeah, look at that. I think we've done like a good 50, <laughs> half hour of uh, of just gaming talk. That that's nice. I guess that's one of the nice things about having the games in the background is it sparks conversations. Um, yeah, Eddie, I think the new version of Descent is really expensive. So I want to see how they justify that price tag. So I will go and check it out. I think it's very unlikely I'll get a review copy of it because uh, it's asthma day and they're not very good at giving those away. And also um, it's very expensive. But uh, I'll try my best. You never know. Tell them you know. And the premier dungeon crawler guy. Don't you know I streamed... Ancient Chronicles. And if I can stream that, I can stream any dungeon crawler. Um, I mean, the audience couldn't understand a word of what was happening on the stream, but I did do it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, and, I'm, and I'm covering Alter Quest, you know. And if you want Descent to be on the list of the, when I do the RSP dungeon crawler adventure game roundup, you know, you better give me a copy. I don't think they'll buy it, but I'll try. In any case, uh, thanks so much, everyone, for hanging out. Um, this has been a lot of fun. And um, I'm super excited for Ankh. So, I don't know. Maybe we'll actually uh, do a, a series with it. Maybe we can get together and film it. That would be amazing. I mean, we can do that legally now. I'm just not sure if we can do it safely. So it's still up in the air, really. Um, you know, the, the numbers here in the UK are not good despite what every, everything else that's been happening. So, you know, I don't, the last thing I want is to put anyone at risk. Um, don't, I, you know, I love board games, but uh, nothing's more important than your health. So we'll see what, uh, we'll, we'll take it easy and we'll see what happens, you know. Um, until tomorrow for Soul Raiders, make sure you subscribe and turn on the bell so you get all the notes when I arbitrarily go live. Thanks everyone so much for watching. And uh, if you're not here tomorrow, have a wonderful weekend. 
and uh, I'll see you all soon. But uh, thanks so much. And uh, oh, thanks everyone so much uh, who supports the show. Here's the credits. I'll see you all soon. Bye for now.